What is going on guys? Happy Wednesday. Today I have on two amazing reefers. Absolutely, I'm gonna call you guys both Coral Masters because it's true. Uh, <laughs> we have, it's true, it's true. Abe from Coral Euphoria and Adam from Fragrage. How the heck are you guys? Good, thanks for having me. We're good, man. Definitely appreciate yeah, you guys coming. Our, our technical side together just in time here. It's always yep. nice when it's down to the wire. <laughs> oh, always, always that last minute pressure to get, get it rolling. So you you guys are by far i'm just gonna call you guys coral masters you guys both have phenomenal coral all your tanks always look awesome all your corals always fire so you definitely know what you're doing i know today we're going to dig more into a bit of like reef nutrition and nutrients and that type of stuff and the fact on coral yeah so i think it should be a fun one today yeah Sounds good i uh, know so I don't know. Who wants to start off? So I guess, Abe, the first time on the stream, so definitely appreciate you joining us. Um, you haven't, um, if no one's checked out your YouTube channel, definitely check that one out, Coral Euphora. You, your videos are always awesome. Your systems, you keep things pretty basic, which I kind of appreciate because I go to the opposite extreme of high-tech everything. Um, but, you, you know, obviously it goes to show that you don't need to be super crazy and keep it fairly simple, and it definitely pays off. Yeah, I'm just one of those reefers who believes that the more stuff you have, the more stuff that can go wrong, the more stuff to maintain. And I have enough stuff to do already, so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's fair. No, okay, I just need to clarify this for my own curiosity. On yours, are all of your tanks plumbed together? Is it one to the next to the next to the next? Like, are they all running off one sump, basically? Yeah, yeah, that uh, T5 system, the 120-gallon. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's not... You know, ideally I wouldn't have it that way. I'd, ideally, I'd have one sump feeding all the different tanks, but mm -hmm. it's just because I had to add those tanks afterwards. And I don't have like one huge stand for all the tanks where I could just throw a big sump under. Yeah. So it's just the 40 gallon breeder under the 120. Okay. It's, it's not ideal. And I think it was part of the reason why I was having problems in the beginning, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's all settled out now. Oh, that's good. It the one thing that I found interesting in one of your recent videos, it, well, because you were saying, okay, this tank drains of this tank drains of this tank drains of this tank, mm -hmm. and then we were also like, oh, this tank's having certain, you know, some issues with something where this one doesn't, which is kind of interesting because they are all connected, same body of water, even though they're still semi-separate systems in a way. Yeah, yeah, um... yeah. It, it's a good opportunity to learn definitely about like the differences in flow and lighting when you know the water chemistry is the same because then you kind of you know if the water chemistry is the same that's not going to be the factor so it's it's an opportunity to learn for sure mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i've definitely experimented over the years with that but most of my systems are um separate now so i have three separate but yeah sometimes i wish i had just one it'd be nice yeah from a gear standpoint i mean if everything's running off one set of dosing one everything there's a lot less work too which is one nice aspect if you maintain one volume of water yeah totally yeah it's not fun doing water changes on three systems that's for sure nope yeah now <laughs> adam you brought up one really good point too like the fact that if everything is one volume of water slash dosing that really gives you like an awesome way to see how different corals react to you know it could be different flow different lighting you know halides versus t5 leds H have you done a lot of experiments with like how you know a certain parameter like lighting for instance or different types of lighting have an effect on a coral and how it colors up differently in different systems uh i mean i'm always making those experiments inevitably whether i'm trying to do that or not it just kind of happens um mm -hmm. Yeah, but probably an example that I really learned about flow was I had a, a 24 by 24, like shallow cube plumbed into my old frag system. And uh, I would have the same acros in that system as my main system. And I found they just never did very well in that in that tank for whatever reason. And, and part of it was like, it's really hard to get really good flow in a small tank because you don't have a lot of space for the water to like carry. It just kind of hits a wall hits another wall, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, for whatever reason, all, the SPS just did not do well in that tank comparatively to the same water. So it's like, you know, there's definitely a lot to flow that I think we don't know still, even though it seemed like there was plenty of flow in that tank, it just didn't have the same, you know, cyclical motion or whatever um, as the big tank. Yeah, that's fair. With, yeah. 
just one other thought slash consideration, because I know you're saying with a small system, it bounces off. But do you take much of an advantage of shooting flow off the glass to try and get it rebouncing back around more? Or is it more, more just concentrate on direct from wherever the power head or gyre or whatever it is is? Yeah, I think it depends on the power head. I think gyres kind of don't draw as much back as they push it out, whereas I think MP40s are better for backflow. Like mm -hmm. if you watch videos, MP40s kind of, you know, throw food in the tank, you can kind of see the circle of, of flow kind of going around with them. Um, so that's why I'm kind of like, maybe like I've, I've added a lot of gyres to my systems over the past three or four years, and I'm kind of starting to like MP40s again a little bit more mm -hmm. um, for that reason. But, uh, you know, I don't know. We're always changing <laughs> stuff, right? It's hard to just like, you know, <laughs> just sit there and be like, hey, this is great. This is all working really well. I'm not going to change anything. Um, and that's where Abe is really good. <laughs> Abe does. <laughs> no, well, I had to I had to learn to like gyres. I mean, it's not my first choice of pump, <laughs> but uh, yeah. it's just because they're, I haven't tried all the pumps. Like I haven't tried narrows, but there are only two pumps so far that I would point directly at my acros. And that's either a Vortec or a Tunzi, but it has mm. to be it has to be a mm. wide mouth Tunzi. But like gyres, they just like rip the tissue off my acros. Yeah. They I have yeah. found that they get used to it and they'll heal mm. over. But generally, it's a very harsh. I call it like gyres put out like a sheet of destruction. Like don't put any <laughs> don't put any acros in that direct flow because it's terrible. But uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I find generally yeah. my gyres are kind of shooting just over the top of my acros. Like they're not really hitting anything direct unless it's like four feet away or something like that, you know? So, Same. Um, but definitely, definitely great pumps. And I think if you, if you plan your flow, so, you know, say one side of the tank has it high and then one side of the tank has a low, then you kind of start to get that cyclical thing I was talking about before with the MPs. So yeah, but uh, still really good pumps for sure. All right, Abe, so would yes, you, sir. you have a whole different slew of special blend of lighting on every tank. <laughs> so have, have you, have you like, just for your own curiosity, done the different experiment where you take, you know, the same coral and put it in different systems and a different lighting and see how the colors or other stuff change with it? Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Um, not, not really as an experiment, but more as like, I just did it just to do it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think, um. T5s definitely color up corals better. Hmm. It's not only, um, well, I'll just tell everybody that I have a metal halide and LED tank, and I have T5 and LED tanks, so both of them hybrids. But um, I found that corals do color up better under T5s. And when I say color up, I mean um, it's not only that they'll look under look better under T5s, it's more like they'll they'll actually develop better color under t5 if you know what i mean it's not like yeah it's probably because it's so well diffused right because t5 light it just gets into every nook and cranny of an acro or a whatever coral like it gets onto every part of it as opposed to like the shadowing i mean obviously how i'd still have a really really good spread but you're still going to get shadowing because it's a point source yeah so i think that's one of the reasons t5s are so good for coloring things up like it's just a consistent like wash of light across it so do you think it is the evenness or do you think there's a difference in spectrum that you're getting out of the bulb versus an LED? I mean, it's supposed to be a wider spectrum. Like it's mm -hmm. supposed to have more of a curve. Um, I don't know when they showed charts of like the breakdown of light and the light spectrum with LEDs, it's always curves, but like those uh, like diodes are like specific nanometers, right? Like, how much of a curve does that actually have? Is it just a sharp point or is it like, uh, is there a range in that point? Um, you know, I wouldn't be able to really comment from a place of experience, but I, I, my, my thought and the same reason for halides working so well is that I think that it's more of like a smooth, smooth spectrum. It's almost like thinking about something being analog versus digital. You know what I mean? Like I think it's, it's, it's more warm, more soft. Yeah. Yeah. I think, just about the whole lighting discussion in the hobby, it's it seems like I'm not anti LED, but it seems <laughs> like um, you know when people argue like LEDs can have just the same exact spectrum as T5s or halides, and th therefore it's exactly the same. A photon is a photon. I personally don't believe that. There's something else you can't compare these different lights with just a spectrum. You know what I mean? Like. Mm -hmm. 
You can't. Yeah. yeah. You just no. have to experience them, really. Mm-hmm. And then you'll know, okay, there's some like halides. There's like, okay, there's something different about this light. It grows coral like crazy with little effort. You can have everything like messed up and it'll still grow coral. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. There, there's too much arguing of that. And I know it's like marketing and all that, but there's too much yeah. of that. Oh, the spectrum is exactly the same. So therefore it's the same light. That's not no, true. It just isn't. No. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I'm still running T5s, but um, I've actually put the photo period way down to about four or five hours on my tanks, um, and then I've turned the LEDs up. So I'm kind of trying to narrow the gap a little bit because I feel like if I can get away with running T5s four hours a day, they're gonna the bulbs are gonna last me probably three years, you know. So, um, you know, like That's... yeah. And then if I have just a few extras, I'm probably good for about ten years, right? <laughs> so strategy. <yeah. laughs> That's. I know what I used to do. I only run LEDs now, but when I used to do the hybrid of LED and T5, that's the same thing. I did like the T5 is like my I knew cooking period is kind of what I called it just for that extra bit of punch throughout the day. Yeah. And something I got to say about like the aquatic light fixtures is they're not overly expensive and they're a great way to hang your lights. Like even if you don't plan on running the T5s very much, like if you just want to run them for like one hour as like a noon peak, it's still it's a great hanging fixture so like you mm-hmm. can attach your led bars to it if you want to run reef brights if you want to run an orfex and then if you want to do any kind of led in the middle um it's a super good way to do it because otherwise you're paying for a mounting system to hang your lights anyways so um so i'm yeah, a big fan of those point. yeah <laughs> okay so l- lighting aside <laughs> i know it, it's it always yeah. makes me laugh because people always have very strong opinions um, full disclosure, I have not run halides before. I've done pretty much everything else, but halides what? due to heat, power, I, I started with T5s and then eventually did LEDs and then I did the hybrids and all that jazz and now I'm back to LEDs again. But I've never tried halides just because the heat and the power of the extra juice. Now, made up, for some people, I mean, you live somewhere cold, the extra heat's probably a bonus. I mean, you live somewhere super hot and you're fighting it, that's another consideration. So I think that probably plays into a chunk of it. Now... I know one of our topics today, I guess, around nutrients, but what do you think is more important for coral? Like lighting, nutrient, or flow? Like those are obviously all, all three important, but what do you think is more important to keep things happy? Hmm. Go ahead, Adam. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I was going to say, <laughs> you mean light, light, lighting, water chemistry, or flow? Because generally those are yeah. the three that we, we talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of, I really wanted to talk to Abe about this. Uh, on your show because it, he's he's a big proponent of of running uh like low detectable nutrients like uh, a good nutrient in nutrient out model um and he has a really really great video on youtube which everybody should watch i think he explains the the whole uh nitrogen you know process really really well and uh and he, he talks about his systems and we've talked about it a fair bit actually because i think more than anything um, you know, if somebody wants to ask me one question, like about my systems, it's usually always, what do you keep your nutrients at? It seems to be like the hot discussion topic these days. And, uh, uh, I think Abe makes a good point against the elevated nutrients model that a lot of people are kind of shooting for. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't really know where to, uh, to go with this. I'm getting a little bit off track, but, uh, as well, far as things that are most important, yeah. I would still break it down to being water chemistry. Yeah. Um, so like, I I guess my example of this is that when my tank is at its best, I've always noticed, and I noticed this in displays in the past, like the coral that's like at the bottom of the tank that fell down in some corner is growing and has axial growth tips on it. And it looks pretty damn good. And it's in the worst spot in the tank. (laughs) That, That just proves to you that water chemistry has to be the most important thing because you know, there's not a lot of good flow down there. It's probably not getting quite enough light, um, but yet growing. So, um, you know, and I've seen the opposite happen where, you know, it's like should be a great placement. Everything checks out. And I don't know, like, yeah, if the water chemistry is not there. It's not there. Yeah, fair. What do you game? I, I, I don't think I could place one over another. I think they're all equally important. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. fair. The, the big three. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> With, I think I would say that maybe lighting is easier to get wrong now than it used to be. Like, I think when it was just T5 or metal halide, like, 
I think it was more just like you turn the light on and you kind of place things accordingly. But now it's like there's so many parameters you can mess around with um, that, yeah, you can try things. And I think LED is like, you know, if I don't really like talking about par because I think LEDs at the same par as, say, a T5 can fry something a lot faster than an LED can. Well, oh, you think... Say it again. Your experience. No, sorry, that... the L- L- LED can fry something a lot faster than T5 okay. can. Okay, 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 that's better. Yeah, at a high part. <laughs> sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I have that problem a lot with customers. Like, because people like to have the PAR listed on my website. Like, it's good information to them. Mm-hmm. But they, when they get the coral, they assume that the frag that I cut them is sitting in that same PAR. And they just... I'm not talking bad about my customers, but it happens a lot that I have to say something about. It. And they just put in the same par and the, the, the frag ends up dying. And it's like, man, you can't do that. You have to light acclimate everything. But exactly what Adam said is what I tell people. It's like 200 par or 300 par in, under T5 is not the same as 300 par under LEDs. I mean, you're, no. yeah. Same thing with metal highlights. They're just all a little different. That's why, like, everybody needs to light acclimate everything that they get. Yeah. If I was to like cut a frag from um, like my 120, which is T5 and LEDs, and put that frag in my frag tank, which is also the same lighting, um, I still light acclimate it. I think it's that important. You know, I start off somewhere on 200 and I'll slowly move it forward. But I think it's really underrated. And exactly what you said, Adam, uh, light acclimation is underrated and PAR is overrated. Yeah. Well, definitely. To, to your customer's note, like if I'm getting a frag off a of buddy and I know it's in crazy high light, I'm not going to worry about light acclimating it if I know it's a similar range. But yeah, if you're getting something online in the mail and you have no idea, it's definitely a good idea to start things low and just work it up. Yeah. Yeah. That, that That's the only reason I would care, right? Like if I go on from Adam and I knew it was, you know, crazy high light in his tank, I'm like, ah, it'll be fine. His light's probably brighter than mine. <laughs> but again, if it's from an unknown source, you don't know then yeah, it's definitely best to ease her into it. That's yeah. My yeah. I just think there's, you know, even though LEDs have gotten better for diffusion, like the, the diffusers or the lenses, I guess, kind of diffuse more than they used to. I think there's still hot spots. I think it's more like, it's just still just kind of, I don't know, like we can't really ever know what's really hitting the coral exactly because when you put a par meter under something, you're just kind of getting this like vague sort of general area reading, but you're not getting the like specific, like, hotspot points either yeah so i don't know yeah i definitely would err on the side of caution um the other thing too is it's like you know if you're adding stuff that to your tank that came from me or customers of abe's like you know just know what he is using for lighting and and you know if you have the same lighting or similar schedule or whatever like you know i my customers always ask me what kind of lighting i use or i just refer them to a video of mine but um, I see what they have and we talk about, you know, what they should start for placement. And it's just like, it's always safe to start at low, you know, it's like, you might as well. Yeah. My experience is you can definitely kill an acro by putting it too high and you almost never kill a coral by having it too low for like three or four days. That's true. While, while it's like adjusting to like the new parameters and totally. stuff. Okay. Now, now you said three or four days. How long would you advise your customers to light acclimate stuff for that you ship out? Well, when I, when they first get it, I think three to four days at around two hundred par is mm-hmm. what I what I like, okay. and then. But it's like over the course of it, it sort of depends on how the uh, coral looks too. If it's a generally a light coral, I recommend a more gentle, more prolonged light acclimation. Mm-hmm. Um, but for I guess for me, when I'm light acclimating, I probably do it over the course over three weeks. I think. Magnetic frag wrecks are awesome because, you know, you can start it at the bottom and then just, just inch it up as you go. And if it looks like it's getting too light, then just move the magnetic frag rack down. I'm not really a fan of the, like, because I guess some radions have um, that light acclimation setting yeah. or whatever. I don't think that's as good as just moving the frag up and down on a magnetic frag rack. But Well, then yeah. you're changing everything for your entire tank, right? So I, I think that's only useful if you just get the lights, right? And you're upgrading for something else and it's a lot more intense. Totally. That's, the only, that's the only time I'd ever use that mode. So, so Adam, you asked earlier, we're talking about, asking Abe about kind of like his nutrient <laughs> levels and like the lower mm. nutrients. So I guess that's another good question for both of you. Do you guys shoot for that whole higher nutrient range? You know, go for the deeper colors? Or you do the, the low nutrients? Like what's your guys' take on it? 
Well, I think saying that higher or lower is the deeper colors is a is a vague statement because, you know, I think Abe and I both agree. We were talking a little while back about how um, we've had our corals look really dark and rich, and we've had barely deductible nitrate and phosphate levels mm -hmm. before. So I think I, here's the main thing: is I think that if your nutrient levels are elevated and they're like easily detectable, say like your nitrates are above five and your phosphate is above 0.04 or something like that. I think even with our hobby grade kits, we can agree that like there is a readable level there, whether it's plus or minus a little bit, but like, mm -hmm. um, oh shit, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, <laughs> well, while you're uh, finding it question. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you, okay, you, you said 0.04 roughly for phosphate and above yeah. five for nitrate. Would you consider that low, medium, higher? Like, how I would, would say, you? I would say, I would say that is slightly elevated, but that's a good range to shoot for. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, my, okay, here's what my point was is that if you have levels in that range, you're, you're basically just assuring that those nutrients are there. You're assuring that there aren't zero. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're testing at zero, zero, they're probably not zero zero, but they're probably close to that. And you're kind of riding more of a fine line. Um, so, I mean, that would be the argument to, to have elevated nutrients. Um, but uh, I would be curious what Abe thinks as far as like, like, do you often get readings that are, are in the zero range or do you get a little bit of something? Well, well, first off, I do agree with what you said in regard to like being a safe range, like 0 0.04 phosphate and like five nitrate. You can't really blame anything wrong with your tank if your nutrients are that, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you're just there, it's perfect. Figure out some other reason why your corals don't look the way they want to, you know what I mean? Either you're bleaching yeah. them or whatever. Um, no, but before, to answer your question, before... For the longest time, I've always had like pretty much undetectable um, nutrients. I say that, but it's partly is because I never tested before. But yeah. also, but, but when I get my ICP test, which is a ATI ICP, they do throw a nutrient measurement in there. I don't I don't know how they do it because um, you know it's it's not an element, so it's not mm -hmm. through the ICP method anyway. Mm -hmm. But every time I got those tests back, um, like nitrate was like one or something, or like 0.5, and then like phosphate would be like 0 0.01. So, you know, pretty oh, close something. to zero. Yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah, and I'm sure like hobby grade test kits with those same levels would just give me straight zeros, right? I mean, that's what I'm guessing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, your your best test kit, if you have good eyes for your corals, is, is just to watch them and to know what, what you know, key things to look for, like, you know, milliporas really need, I think, some phosphates and nitrates, and they start to get, they're one of the acros to me that get lighter, and um, polyps kind of shrink. It's not just polyp extension, but people are always asking about polyp extension, but polyp extension has a lot to do with the health of the actual polyp, which is the animal in the colony in the first place, you know. But uh, yeah, actually, something funny I was going to mention, uh, I think I was reading the, the Vivid Aquarium's website. They have a little kind of about our corals, kind of like just a little thing about our parameters, and they say something like, it's just a really like basic way to break it down. They're like, uh, uh, tanks with uh, nitrate less than two and phosphate less than 0.02 can kill corals. It's like just a very simple statement, but can kill corals or corals can die. It's something along those lines, but it's like- Zero can kill like, corals for sure. They're, they're, I mean, but, it, but it's just, it's a safe measurement to kind of go by to say, okay, let's just make sure there's something in there. Yeah. You know, I, I think that, you totally. know, if you- if you have a tank, like if you're just super, super in tune with what you're looking at, as far as your coral um, health, um, you might be able to get away with something almost undetectable. Like I do get the occasional reading of my nitrates at zero. It's just, mm. I mean, and it's like, it definitely I'm not, not putting any nitrates in the tank. I'm feeding like crazy. You know, I've got tons of fish, like it's, they're going in there. They're just getting yeah. used so fast. And it's just the same way the ocean is too. Well, I would also like to point out that you both grow copious amounts of corals and any nutrients in your tank, your corals are sucking it up. Like you're, you know, people use algae for export. I mean, your corals are exporting probably all the nitrate and phosphate you're putting in because they do absorb it and they do use it, right? And just the vast mm. amount of corals you have are going to keep your parameters pretty dang low unless you have a ton of fish or feeding tons. At least that's my thoughts on that one. 
Yeah, uh, no, I was going to say something similar. Like it's it's hard when uh, uh, you have to be cautious when you're taking advice from like coral farms because they they don't have one fish per every ten gallons like I do. You know what I mean? And I'm <laughs> feeding my fish every day, it, even though I my if my nitrates and phosphates came back at zero, are they really zero? Probably not, because my because my fish are consuming all the food mm -hmm. and, and they're also pooping, which probably gets, you know, taken up by the corals quickly. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, maybe Vivid does have one fish per 10 gallon, but I just, I just uh, agree that it's, it's hard to be really at zero if you have a full bio load, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I don't think it's, I don't know. think it's really, I don't think it's really zero. Um, like you said, Adam, I think if you're at zero, you're, it's probably, more of an advanced reefer thing, but you're going to have to go by the look at your corals to see whether they're getting the adequate nutrition. Yeah. And on that note too, but if you're reading zero, like unless you're running something like a GFO, they're likely not zero. Like you pointed out, like I see people that have a tank full of algae and be like, Oh, I have zero phosphates. It's like, yeah, cause your algae sucking it up. Right. I think this, in this respect, it's similar idea with corals are sucking up a chunk of it. So it might be, your hobby grade test, it might be reading zero, but it's probably not actually well, zero. It's another area where I think Abe and I differ in uh, what we use in our systems is Abe's a big user of uh, macro algae for nutrient export, right? Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. I recently took out my fuge though. Okay, yeah, because I've, I've tried them in the past and I've always just thought it just bought them everything out way too fast. It worked too well. And then I also, I think if coral are essentially like a plant hybrid as an animal like they're that the plant tissue like the zooxanthellae are competing with algae for a lot of certain you know trace elements and stuff like that so um yeah i mean abe how often do you do icps like are you pretty regular with it or i haven't done one in like four months but i used to do them like every three months uh, i'm gonna yeah. i'm just slowing down but uh yeah my, no my trace elements are generally pretty low yeah. Um, except for potassium, because I, you know, I use Red Sea Coral Pro, which has good enough potassium. But yeah, almost everything, strontium, they're all low. Um, but I, I do yeah. think it's a valid point about, uh, you know, algaes competing with your corals for, you know, trace elements and whatnot. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's something to watch out for, for sure. Yeah. And but I think it, even uh, talking about potassium, I don't even really consider it a trace element. It's it's right. kind of more of a macro element. Same with iodine. I mean, I yeah. think we're talking about trace elements. We're talking more about molybdenum and iron and copper and vanadium, okay. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't, um, I don't but, get too yeah, caught it, up in all but that. It's, but it's like that stuff. Oh, I, did, I mean, I didn't say that to be like, oh, what I mean. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, potassium, I think at this point is kind of agreed that it's kind of like, it's, you know, 400 parts per million in seawater. That's that's a pretty large reading as far as elements go. You know, that's as much as calcium in our tanks, right? So so it's so, more of a macro element for sure, but a very right. important one. So, Adam, you sound like you pay more attention to trace elements. Abe, you sound like you don't care about trace elements. Um, is it something that you pay attention to or dose or do you use whatever you get from water changes? Like, what's your level of worrying or caring about the trace side of things? I guess Abe first. Uh, I have a cabinet full of all these ATI <laughs> trace elements that are, you know, that's hundreds of dollars. Um, so that's, that's what I think about them. No, but I, I did experiment with them. That was when I was doing yeah. a lot of ICP tests. I didn't really find a difference. I mean, cause yeah. you can't so really were... say that like, you know, I don't know, just pretend like a uh, copper, uh, the recommended copper is 0 0.04 PPM or something like that. You can't, can we really say that 0 0.02 PPM copper is worse than, you know, 0 0.04 or so. I, so I don't buy it. Yeah. If you get an ICP test back and it's like, oh, this should be 0 0.7 and you're like 0 0.02, are you going to open your cabinet of elixirs and dump some in and correct it? Or are you going to be like, yeah, that's fine? I'd be like, oh, that's fine. Okay. What a yeah. waste of money. I think, I think really <laughs> it's just like it, having a reading is better than absolutely nothing. But yeah. um, I would be really hesitant to mess around with some of those heavy metals um you know especially um um actually jake adams told me uh, that copper testing is kind of known to be a little bit of a like not a super reliable test in the icp world um and um 
I don't know. I, I'd be interested to see what some of the main ICP people say about that. Um, but I don't think Jake would say that lightly, um, you know. Um, totally. uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, it, anyways, based on that, I've been a little bit hesitant about raising the copper level. If I have a copper reading on an ICP, whatever it is, I'm just like, okay, sure. As long as it, there's something. But uh, so, yeah. So what, what do you think, Adam? If you do an ICP and a bunch of your levels are way below what the ICP recommends, are you going to bump stuff back up? Or what are you going to do? Or nothing? Yeah, I've, I've been making little adjustments. Um, I've been using the uh, Fawn Marine method. And, uh, you know, I can't say, like, I probably for six months now have been testing uh, ICPs maybe every month and a half, sometimes mm -hmm. after a month. Um, and I make the adjustments. I make them more slowly and, and carefully than uh, they even recommend. Like I'll do it at half the rate that they tell you you should raise it by. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, my corals look really good right now. Like, is it is that the reason? Like, it's it's always just a combination of all the things you're doing. So yeah, um, you know, yeah, I, the, I I definitely like the idea of the um, the reef blueprint. Um, what is it? The isolate MT. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you should have Chris Wood on here sometime actually, because he he'd be a great. Get, you I'm haven't had him on, have you? Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. No. Remind yeah, me later. I'll yeah, let him on. <laughs> yeah, um, but he basically figured out a way to get all of those those trace elements to kind of like ionically kind of get along in the same bottle. Mm. Um, and if, if you were just going to add something to your tank, it's like, just add a couple drops of that, like, you know, once a week or something, because then something's going in and it's like, it's probably never going to be too much, but it's going to be something versus nothing. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, I think being deficient of something is trouble, but it's good to have trace amounts of it so that you're not potentially starving something on a specific coral. I know I've told this example a few times, but I know back in the day when I used to play at the Red Sea ones way back when, I remember I overdosed a bunch and that definitely changed the color of certain corals or certain mm -hmm. colors to overtake other corals. And then what I've noticed from when I was, was actually paying attention and dialing in the trace elements, it's not like a night and day difference, but it does give certain colors more vibrance and like your corals are going to get 90% there on their own, 95%. So that extra, like, 5% of extra bit of pop or vibrance. But it's one of those things, whether or not it's worth chasing. I mean, that it really depends on where you are yeah. as a reefer and how much you care. But that's yeah. my I, personal experience down that rabbit hole. To add to that, too, I think if you're doing, uh, like, I never would have the patience to do weekly water changes. But if you're doing mm -hmm. weekly or, or bi-monthly water changes, then you're going to be, uh, you know, replenishing some of that, that those trace elements with a good salt anyways. So... Um, which actually, I, we should talk to Abe about salt because I'm pretty sure Abe uses uh, cheap salts, right? Like you use in, reef crystals, or I was using a Red Sea Coral Pro. I'm actually okay transitioning oh, right. back to reef crystals, but then I might just stick with Red Sea Coral Pro. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but I do I do do water changes, to, and uh, I, I know it doesn't bring trace elements back up to perfect, but it does give some. So. That's part yeah. of the reason why I do them. That's fair. I guess yeah. how like how often and like do you do pretty large ones or you do small ones? Like what's your water change mentality? It's probably like twenty percent every two to three weeks. I'm not that yeah. consistent, but that's generally what it is. Yeah. Yep. How about you, Adam? Uh right. yeah, I think I do about twenty percent on the two big systems that are about three hundred and fifty ish gallons. Um, so yeah, I do 60 gallon water changes on those. So, okay. Um, now, now yeah. are these actual water yeah. changes or you just sell some corals and dump a little more yeah. every time yeah, you well, suck I, some out? Technically <laughs> I do little ones all the time. I guess you could yeah. say like I add, you know, four or five gallons after packing a few orders or whatever. So, um, yeah, yeah. In, in that sense, there's little tiny water changes. I, I don't know how much those teeny tiny ones make for a difference, but it's, it's something again, it's, you're adding some, some good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I did, I, I mean, we talked about salts a bit before, but I switched to red sea blue bucket, um, probably four months ago now. And I think it's a way better product than the bright well that I was using before. And I, oh. I don't mean, you know, what, talk now what's another, product, but, what is um, the, sorry, what is the noticeable difference to you? Like, 
what makes so you say main... this salt's better than that salt? Yeah, because I've kind of gone all over the place with this whole salt <laughs> thing. But um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think it's the fact that like it mixes in like like I I need to mix up a batch really quickly the other day, and like mm -hmm. I swear, like I put it, I have like a big ass pump in my mixing um, reservoir. I pro it probably was clear in about 15 minutes, okay. um, you know, like and almost nothing white in the bottom. And, and I would say with the Brightwell, like it would take hours, sometimes like an entire like day to be clear. Wow. So like, what is that telling you about the salt? Like, Not a you know, I, just, I, like if, yeah. if there's so, you know what I mean? Like, and, and the Brightwell was, I would test the alkalinity on it um after it had lots of time to mix like say two days three days later um and my alkalinity would test at like 6.5 you know super super low um mm. so um and i will also say uh my icps have been better since i've been using the red sea as well so um and for the price point i mean it's like you know cheap enough too so um yeah definitely That's a fair. fan of it what do you use Devin? Um, currently either Aquaforce or Brightwell are the two that I have. So I just randomly pick, Okay. but I've used many and honestly, like it's hard to say one salt is much better than another or there's a, or there's a noticeable difference. Like for years and years, I just bought whatever was cheap and on sale at the time. And I never paid attention. Like I would <laughs> see people being like, how do I change salts? And they're all worried about it. Like you just use it. Like there's nothing special about it. Now, I will say this with the caveat, if, if you don't dose and you're relying on your salt for all of your parameter supplementation, then you might care a bit more about, you know, what, what's the elk? What are the levels, right? Am I keeping it fairly consistent? But in my opinion, if you're dosing anyways and you're not doing like 100% water changes, you know, if you're doing a 20% water change and you're dosing and doing stuff with other means, it's not really going to be that big of a difference of what salt to use. The biggest yeah. difference I see is, okay, there's my mixing bin looks better. Or this is better, right? So it, it's hard to say. But again, this comes down to the quantity and frequency of your water changes and how much you're relying on the salt versus how much you're dosing through other means. And that, that goes for trace elements, goes for everything, right? If you're doing big massive water changes, you could probably care less about trace elements, right? If you never do water change, then you might want to pay a bit of attention more because you're definitely going to be deficient after a while. Those are kind yeah. of my... My general yeah reference. and i i think too it's like um like a tank that's full of large colonies is just the the consumption level of these things is completely different than a, a fresh tank that's you know say you have a 180 gallon tank and it's like you know basically all new water you put a whole bunch of frags in there it's like you don't really have to worry about the trace elements getting sucked up very quickly in a tank like that like we're we're talking about like tanks where the you know like my systems Junior are like tanks. absolutely <laughs> jam-packed yeah. with coral like and yeah. they're all growing axial growing tips like actively growth growth tips everywhere um so it's so exponentially more than a young tank so i don't really uh, yeah. suggest people with a with a young system obsess over trace elements like chances are if you just started with a bunch of brand new water it's probably pretty freaking close to um you know where it started off yeah anyways i think it's a great point when i look back at my mm -hmm. icp tests the earlier ones are the better ones and i'm like what's going yeah. on now i use the same salt and yeah the yeah. early ones are like almost perfect <laughs> yeah yeah anyway your frags weren't sucking too much um yeah. but that that is a great point like don't even worry about entire tanks at least a year year and a half old before you even consider worrying about it yeah yeah um I had a good question that I completely lost. Um, there's a question for you in the chat a little while ago, but I saw some of them pop up again. But they're asking, what do you think is the difference of like some corals that are like hard to keep or certain frags where they just won't do well in someone's tank? Um, someone else said they can't keep chalices for the life of them. And there's someone else that said, okay, like the Pikachu Acro, it just will not survive for me. Do you, do you have any nemesis corals or do you have any thoughts on certain corals that just don't like a certain tank? I mean, I do, and yeah, I mean, it's probably, be, and I think that's going to go for everybody. There's going to have some that do well and then some that don't, some that don't, and there'll be some that are like in the middle of that. It probably has to do with, um, you know, the region they came from, like the minor differences in, I don't know, temperature, trace elements or nutrients even, and even mm -hmm. like a par maybe, maybe flow. That's what I think, you know. It's just we're we're putting all these different corals from all over the world into one tank. It's, yeah. It's, it's it's no it's no surprise that they don't all do well. Yeah. Um But I'm gonna like I'm pretty sure that every reefer has that problem of some doing well, some not doing so well. 
Uh, but- yeah, I'll admit I'm I'm not very good at eight cans. Like you know, I I and and that's a coral I will say for sure. Definitely likes elevated nutrients and more food. So mm. you know, if you want to keep eight and very easy to give too much light as well. Um, yeah. Or sorry, I shouldn't say eight cans. Uh, Micromusa lords. Uh, <laughs> You know, Jake just dispelled be, down at you. Yeah, yeah. Just in in his <laughs> honor, we shall we shall yep. use the correct scientific names. Um, <laughs> but mm-hmm. yeah, no, I've never been great at them. You know, I've grown lots of them over the years into decent sized colonies, and um, I just I haven't been really really consistent with them. Like often they will start to recede or or just you know for whatever reason just not do so well. Um, so not my forte for sure feeding them makes a big difference in my experience yeah. from like they've okay. really benefit with color and just happiness of actively being fed and i find if you don't feed them then they can slowly dwindle if they don't get enough food or nutrients yeah yeah no it's probably it it's probably just my uh my laziness of feeding them for the most part being a good you know frag daddy <laughs> <laughs> good, old good frag provider <laughs> do you abe do you do you f- Spot feed your corals, broadcast feed, feed the tank. Do you feed them at all? What's your thoughts? No. No? None of that? I, I did buy, like, refroids a long time ago, and, like, whenever I remember, I'll just mix it in with the food just to get rid of it, but I don't think it does anything. <laughs> um, just to use the pouch up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, so it, definitely, something it definitely raises phosphates. I mean, yeah. you know that for sure. Refroids does raise your phosphates, so that's you know, a good natural way to do it. How much of it the coral takes in? I don't know. Like I've, you know, turned off the flow, based it a bunch, like very gently. And like, I don't see it sticking to the acro polyps and the acro polyps closing. I I don't know. Like, I would love to see a video of that. Maybe there is one on YouTube. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but like, people have tried. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't see them actually take it. The only thing I ever, there used to be this thing called cyclopes. Do you remember that? Cyclopes, Mm -hmm. those little red, copepods yep. um i don't know if they still make it but that i feel like i remember polyps taking that in i think there, i remember them actually pulling it into their gut and like you know ingesting it there's yeah. one called canalis i think I don't, I don't know if it's cyclopes but super similar it's like the little red specks yeah and yeah I, I, yeah i randomly mix that one in but i'm yeah terrible at spot feeding i think i just at once i'll randomly add stuff in and just dump it in the tank and it goes everywhere for the fish yeah. and corals get what they get but yeah well what i've been doing to feed my um lps system is i just turn all the flow off and instead of the frozen food that i would feed to the fish i just baste it into all my torches and hammers and whatever mm-hmm. you know corals have a meaty polyp that can take it in and um you know the fish get a lot of it but the coral probably gets some of it too so um, yeah. That's an easy way to do it without being like, okay, I'm going to feed my corals. It's like, well, you're going to feed your fish anyways. You might as well just like give the corals the first shot at it. And then whatever's yeah. left, will get picked off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. hey, what, what do you feed your tank? Do you feed frozen? Do you feed pellets? What do you feed for your fish and your creatures? Currently I do um, Hikari mysis, Hikari brine shrimp, and then like ocean nutrition, formula two, formula one, and uh, brine shrimp. So nothing too fancy. <laughs> yeah, that works. Do you have you ever rinsed your mysis or do you just dump it in? Oh no, I rinse it. I, I thought do you, it, eh? I have That's a little strainer. No <laughs> yeah, I have a little strainer and yeah, and it gets defrosted and then I drain the water out and then I'll put the brine shrimp and mysis into there. Okay. It's just I don't even know if it does anything. It's just a precaution to remove anything that doesn't need to be there. No, the funny thing is that like um, I have an opposite thought on that one, where with the mice, I've never in my life because I figure all those tiny specks of like mice juice and stuff is just like coral food and amino acids. I'm like, oh, perfect, coral food free. But yeah, no, I agree drink, with that. But, yeah. Like my uh, my little uh, strainer, it's really a very fine mesh, so I try mm-hmm. to keep as much as that of that as possible. But yeah, I agree with that. There's probably some little particles in there that could end up as coral food. That's always yeah, been my I've thought. definitely done, I've done both. Sometimes I've, you know, strained it and thawed it and been super careful. And sometimes I just take a chunk and just wave it around and let it dissolve in the tank. Like, <laughs> I don't know. But part of it is also like my systems are often running at a lower nutrient level. And um, if there's some extra nitrates in that, you know, ice, icy water that surrounds the mysis or whatever, like maybe that's good. But it's uh, like, thank you. Um, it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, you know, mysis are also like a freshwater uh shrimp or whatever so the 
you know, I mean, you're in- introducing some weird water to your tank that's not salt water. Um, yeah, so, I agree. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't like yeah. that part of it. It's like I, I would rather yeah. feed all salt water related fish or yeah, totally. or food. Yeah, yeah. That's... There used to be this company that used to collect uh, uh, fresh plankton in the Georgia Strait here, like close to where Devin and I are, and uh, and it was like the best food I've ever fed my fish in my tanks. And you can't get I I don't know if anybody processes it anymore, but uh, hit me up if you do, because that was like the, you're actually feeding coral, you know, some of the best nutrients from the ocean, like supernatural. Um, yeah, it's probably an underrated aspect of like nutrient import mm-hmm. and like the, also the trace elements that are in those foods yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah i think there's all kinds yeah. of omegas and and you know it's you know they grow freaking whales out of those things all right you know yeah <laughs> that's true uh reef sea forever yeah. how how about phyto do any of you guys know phytoplankton or any of those type of People, stuff in your tank? Uh, i did like uh, two decades ago but uh, yeah I didn't really find a difference, but people really swear by that these days. I just have trouble, like, yeah. with that making sense in my head, because <laughs> corals are carnivores. But then you could yeah. argue, okay, well, the phyto is feeding the pods, and then the ph- pods are breeding, and then the pods end up into the coral. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's all contributing to that sort of microfauna in the system that you know makes, um, you know, little little things available for corals. It probably all helps. Um, Mm-hmm. The the thing is more like I think for me it's like it comes down to the cost, especially if you have big systems. It's like Fido, I guess, is cheap if you're culturing your own, but if you're going out and buying bottles of it, I don't know. You know, some people go and they buy these live foods, like what are those you can buy certain pods and stuff that are in a bottle and they're like sort of kept at a cool temperature so they're alive, but but it's just like that's an expensive treat. It's like sometimes I like, you know. I don't know. Like I think about what I feed myself and I'll be like, Oh, I shouldn't spend the extra four dollars to add the you know, you know, the the bacon to the cheeseburger or whatever. <laughs> but it's like it's like I should I should treat myself better than my corals do. But yeah, we spend so much money on our tanks, it's silly sometimes for sure. I'm uh, looking at a Rob B's reef comment. Fido is for NPS and pods, not corals. Like I don't I don't need food for my pods, they do fine. <laughs> I have a ton of pods and I don't have NPS, but yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I still don't get it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I will yeah. say it. Yeah. NPS. So if you have filter feeding corals, they will appreciate the phyto regular acros. I yeah. mean, that that's a pretty debatable one. Um, like small baby clams, they'll appreciate it. Once they're over about three inches they're more photosynthetic than filter feeding. Well, to that extent, but so it, there is some corals that appreciate it, but just as the general tank, like, um, Pods, if you want to explode a pod population, like I used to culture phyto and pods and all I fed the pods was phyto and then they, they expanded like crazy. So, I mean, it definitely will up yeah. your pod population, which could be fish food. Yeah. Maybe it's coral food. I don't know. It kind of depends. So it's one of yeah, those that's things. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, like, I mean, when you have like a, like a, an environment that is isolated like that and you can feed the pods the, the phyto and they, they reproduce and grow and thrive, it's like, there's your proof. It's like, they're obvious it's that's enough of a food source for them to exist right so mm-hmm. um yeah i mean i would say it's definitely doing some positive things to your tank but we i think we know i mean a lot of things we talked about today is i just, don't know man. It's all of these things we do <laughs> that combine together to make our tanks successful like but you yeah know, we I do guess... a lot of things like it, it all contributes to the whole so it's like what do you just what do you think is the most important and what do you think is cost effective I'm just, no, I agree with that because that can get expensive, Mm. the Fido. But it's like, what's wrong with your tank that you don't have pods, bro? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, How many mandarins do you have? (laughs) Yeah. Maybe you have too many grasses or something. I don't know. There are other ways to get pods, not just Fido. And then we haven't even talked about like the nutrients that it adds to the water. I meet a lot of guys who are like, I can't keep my phosphates down. And it's like, okay, what do you add to your tank? They're like, Fido, oyster feast. I'm like, dude, what are we doing here, bro? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I don't know what, okay, Dan, that, that seems extreme, but he says, I accidentally dosed a huge amount of phyto to the tank to the point where the water is green. Some corals the next day were triple the size. We're we talking polyp extension. There's no way they tripled in growth, but I'm curious to know what the actual yeah. difference was. <laughs> if they tripled in growth, then you're onto something. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Everyone's going to have green tanks going forward. Uh, yeah, crazy. So, 
another this is like kind of an offshoot of this but one thing that i constantly debate because like in my tank i run ozone i run filter rollers i have like freaking crystal clear my fish are floating look of water in my tank but a lot of the time like if you look at the ocean there is like a soup of coral snow random stuff floating so it's like there's a constant source of small particles of food where my tank i i probably strip that all out that's why i don't care and i feed a lot more stuff because i figure i probably have to balance that out a bit more but do you think that we are over filtering our tanks and potentially starving our corals from food from that perspective again, again most are photosynthetic yeah. right but there is a certain percentage where they eat stuff out of the i way. i think that we we pull out a lot of good stuff with our skimmers that we could leave on and i, I talked mm. to you about this last time i actually have my skimmer set so when my ph hits eight point four i think uh, my skimmer turns off so it turns off for about six to eight hours a day um and that's also the time of day that i feed so there's this big period of time where my tank is still at an elevated ph and all of those nutrients are available for the corals while they're at the peak point of the day that they're growing and consuming mm -hmm. um so um i i suggest people try it if people can afford to have their skimmer off as far as um it not affecting their ph too much and if their nutrient levels are um not super high um then I, I i'm a big advocate for it i used to turn my skimmer off all the time so um yeah yeah i think it's a tricky because like do you how many fish do you i mean you don't have anywhere near one fish per 10 gallons do you add them in your big old farm mm, i think i'm pretty close to that uh might be a little less like because you would you you generally say this one fish per 10 gallons but uh how many okay say in a hundred gallon tank, tank would we say <laughs> in a hundred gallon tank would we say like one large fish or two no I, I usually go for like uh like 30 to 40 percent big fish like tangs and the rest yeah. kind of like smaller yeah. medium yeah because based on that model like one of my six by three frag tables would have like eight to 10 big freaking tangs in it, which I don't, <laughs> you know, I have three to four per side as far as large fish. Um, yeah, the, no, the reason, actually. Yeah. I was just gonna say the reason I ask is because if I turn my skimmer off for like four hours a day or whatever, I'm going to have algae problems. Really? So, yeah. 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 Oh. I, if my skimmer's yeah. off my pH is tanks. Like I rely heavily on my skimmer for, that's a big not thing destroying my pH, but I yeah. I would say my tank's probably overstocked, and I have a ton of tangs and big fish in there, and there's lots of lots of stuff breathing CO2 in the tank. Yeah. yeah, no, I would say my fish load is lower probably than what you guys have per gallon. Um, mm. Yeah, and and part of that is just like the tanks are so jam packed with coral that I, I don't want to put too many fish in to try to have to navigate around everything. It's there's only you know so much room for for everybody to get along. So yeah. yeah 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 it's true okay there, there's been a handful of questions in the chat about your guys' thoughts on like red fuel ratio or and if you guys pay attention do you keep the one to ten or any of that type of stuff like do you pay much attention to it do you try and keep somewhat of a balance or just it they are where they are uh i mean i definitely think the ratio is important um mm -hmm. i think it's actually more important than the numbers are um like i don't really I mean, obviously, we know that super, super elevated is not good. Super wide apart is not good one way or the other. I would say, um, you know, if the ratio is inverted, that's probably the worst scenario when the phosphates are super high and the nitrates are low. But uh, I ran really high nitrates and low phosphates for a while. And it was actually Abe's video that kind of got me thinking a little bit about maybe I'm overshooting the nitrates a little bit. So over mm -hmm. the past six months, I brought them down. And I now I've actually realized my ratio is a lot better. It's uh, like we talked about before. My phosphate's about 0 0.03, 0 0.04, and my nitrate usually tests somewhere between two and five. So it's a, about a hundred to one ratio. Um, yeah. And things look better than ever right now. Um, and I think you can say that's pretty consistent through most healthy systems. Is that ratio is going to be kind of somewhere between? I mean, some people will say that the ten to one ratio is good. There's a lot of people that that like the higher phosphate but um yeah but red field ratio for the record is supposed to be 16 to 1 i think yeah. is that right yeah yeah and that's like a common uh is it i think it's found in nature and it's kind of like plants 
consume nitrogen and phosphorus in that ratio. That's kind of the healthy ratio that they consume it in. So if it's available in that ratio, then things are kind of stabilized. Yeah. What do you think, Gabe? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I kind of took that one. Yeah. Let's see what no, no, I was just letting you talk because you were just saying everything that I was thinking. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, no, but I, I agree. I agree. The, the ratio is probably more important than the actual numbers. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do think that closer to 100 to 1 is probably better. I suspect. I don't know for sure, but I do yeah. suspect that. Um, yeah. But one reason, I think, one reason why I think Rolofoss works well for me is in running it 24 seven because people are always like, oh crap, you run it 24 seven. Like I'm going go to <laughs> like I'm gonna go to reefing hell or something. Um, Why wouldn't you want to run it 24 seven? Because people, because the reefing community nowadays is, are so paranoid about bottoming out phosphate. Oh no, your tank is going to get nuked. Never well, bottom out. That whole, the whole, oh crap, my battery's going to die. Go oh, ahead. Da, da, da. Well, I was going to say, well, well, zero is bad. Um, in my early days of reefing, I used way too much GFO because I was so afraid of algae. And then I definitely had coral suffer and pale out and not happy because of zero. So zero is bad. Yeah. But Rolfos yeah. or GFO is by far the easiest way to like keep phosphates in check if you have a heavy fish load. Yeah. Uh, but because my systems run low, uh, tend to run low nitrates, I'm still here. I'm just changing the battery. <laughs> Sounds good. I, I think it's why my corals do so well is because I'm, I am driving the phosphates out of the system. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I have very low phosphates yeah. probably, and I'm yeah. still maintaining that 100 to 1, and my corals look fine. Yeah. So, that, that yeah, that's why I suspect the ratio is probably more important than the actual numbers. Why am I orange now? <laughs> oh, probably reset white, your white, white balance. balance. White balance issues. White balance, buddy. Reset yeah. when you change the battery. It annoys me. Mine does the same <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> What okay question? Well, you're playing with it. Rolofoss versus GFO is what is there any noticeable difference? Because I noticed you specifically said Rolofoss, and that's what I, I've used them both interchangeably. I tend to like Rolofoss a bit better, I don't know why I like mm -hmm. it better, but I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on that one. Um, I thought because this was back in like 2009 when I tried uh, beer, I'll just say oh, it's sponsored by BRS though, sorry. No, yeah. but I did try theirs. I did find it to be a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like how um, I had to rinse it. Because Royal Foss, you technically don't have to rinse. I still do, though, because I find it's really orange at first. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And then the other point of... Oh, Royal Foss um, lasted longer for me. So okay. it is more expensive, and, but I think it's the same price because it lasts longer. But uh, just real quick on the point of rinsing. It's like, I don't rinse, but I do... When I do change the roll foss, I'll put the output into my filter sock, so it all goes mm. in there. So, yeah, I mean, I don't like it going into my tank either, but uh, yeah. I I just run under the tap for a couple of minutes and do it with cold water, fresh water, and then throw it in the tank. But yeah, I know they say don't rinse. I don't know the orange. I just like not putting in there. But I do agree. I do feel like it does last longer. So I'm with you on that one. So I don't use any of that stuff, so I can't I can't comment. It's been many years since I used. Anything to remove phosphates from my tank. So just, if anything, just I'm just it. adding adding a lot of it. <laughs> I was just inspired to kick off a phosphate test. I'm curious where it's at because I changed my row phos last week and I haven't tested in a while. <laughs> yeah. And something I'll say, like I've been pretty heavy on my dosing uh, neophos for the past um, maybe three or four months. Uh, and I still like my reading hasn't changed that much. Like the readings that I get are still in the sort of 0.02 to 0.05 range. Um, but my corals have gotten darker and especially my milliporas have like way better polyp extension, um, richer, deeper color, mm. faster growth. Um, I do think there's a threshold with phosphate when an elevated phosphate can start to affect growth because it is known that phosphate does mess with the calcification process when corals are growing. Um, so what? I don't know at what point too much okay. is too much and you actually see a reduction in growth. I can definitely say when I used to run my system at really low nutrients, and I, this is back in the old school days when I didn't even test nit you know, nitrates and phosphates, they were definitely very low. But some mm -hmm. of my corals grew like freaking crazy. Like things like Red Planet. Like I had a Red Planet that I think in three years was like... My nemesis. I don't know. Like it was probably like... 18 to 20 inches in like three or four tables in like I think I grew that in like two and a half years or three years or something like that just freaking mm -hmm. massive 
I don't think I grow it that fast now under yeah. my current conditions. I don't know. Do you, what Doesn't is help your... that I'm fragging it all the time, though. <laughs> although, although fragging, I almost find it stimulates growth to, to an, a certain extent for yeah, you frag it. For sure. Like, like obviously yeah. not too much, but some fragging can actually help stimulate a bit. Now, yeah. w when you, like, you're dosing stuff like uh, Neil Foss, do you, what what is your thoughts on dosing like neophos versus just feeding more or dumping in reforage or something else a different nutritional source of phosphates versus just liquid phosphates? I've tried feeding more. I don't feel like I can feed enough to do yeah. it. Maybe at this point I need more fish, but um, that I just get wary about adding fish. You know, it's like I have a population of fish; they all get along, they all mm. kind of do a good job. The thing that they do. Um, I, you know, just adding new tangs, even if they've been quarantined, I just, you know, like I have this awesome collection of fish. Most of them, I have been either in my system for a long time or came from a tank shutdown that where I knew they were all, you know, super well acclimated, like healthy fish. Um, mm. so I don't know, I don't have a QT system for, for fish. So I don't know. I, uh, I think at this point I'm okay with just adding some extra um, phosphate manually. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's probably, I mean, the, you could have this argument probably with a lot of people, but, uh, is nutrients derived from fish poop and feeding more better than adding the actual elements themselves? I don't know if it really matters. I don't know if it's any different at the end of the day. That's one thing I've uh, always been yeah. curious about when people are trying to up nutrients. I'm like, yeah, it's dumping more food. Just as, as curious on your guys' thoughts. Yeah. What do you think, Abe? Yeah. yeah, what do you think, Abe? Like Yeah, what do you got? <laughs> organic organic nutrients versus adding nutrients in a bottle. Um <laughs> It works for me. But yeah, I, I think that if you if your if your um ratio was messed up, all screwed up the whole hundred to one thing, then maybe you should look into dosing um, you know, whatever nutrient you need to get yeah. up closer. Mm -hmm. um, but That's if you're if you're if yeah. your ratio is good, maybe just feeding more might just do the trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just want like a just a general raise level, and you're not shooting for a number. Also, you right. don't need to shoot for a number. Like, there's no point in shooting for a number. I've started. I'm I'm testing my phosphates and nitrates way less than I used to. I was doing it once a week. Now I'm doing it, you know, once every two weeks or once a month. I just it's like I I can tell what's going on for the most part. You know, if corals start to get a little lighter, like I can pretty much know that, you know, I need to feed more or check something or raise something. But, um, you know, and corals can get pale from lots of different other things, too. Like, I mean, there's there's definitely other reasons for it. But uh, in mm -hmm. a really stable, consistent system that's been running for a long time, you just kind of know. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Um, well, I, you, that's also part of the experience thing, right? Where after you have you know, you're a few years into reefing, you kind of get a good feel of what a coral should look like and when it's not healthy or not happy about something, right? Just by the color, you know, no pop extension or it's paling out or it's, you know, losing color. kind of gives you a feel for, okay, didn't like what I just did. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Actually, I have a question for Abe about uh, two-part supplements because I've had this uh, discussion with a couple of people. Um, so a lot of the two-part supplements like ESV, be ionic it tells you that you should always add equal parts of both and some yeah. people will come to me they'll be like i'm adding equal parts of these two parts and my calcium is like 500 and something and my and my alkalinity is eight or whatever and they're like to keep my alkalinity at eight my calcium is super high and i'm just kind of like well shouldn't you just dose less of the calcium side yeah you know it just yeah. it makes sense to me i i don't think there's anything good about having um I, I definitely have never seen my tanks do better when my calcium has been above, you know, 440 or 450. Like I actually shoot lower than that just to be on the safe side. But yeah. um, there's some like, I don't know if you know anything with the chemistry of it, because your videos are pretty good at talking about that stuff. But um, like, is there something about adding those in equal parts that gives it that proper ionic balance? Because to me, if your calcium is 500, that's kind of out of balance. It's all about the negative and um, positive ion. Well, not all about that, but that's part of it, right? Yeah. When the chemists talk about that and say we should add equal parts because you're dosing, you know, sodium carbonate or whatever or calcium 
chloride. So it's trying to balance that or not or trying to not get too um, skewed in, in too much uh, sodium or too much calcium or chloride. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The, so there's also there's also the sulfate part of it that the chemist would argue is like important and then like having a, a proper balance. Um, yeah. My response to that is. I get it. It makes sense. It, you know, from a chemistry standpoint and like stoichiometry or whatever the heck it's called. I forgot what it's called. Yeah. I think that's what it's called. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it makes sense in a test tube, but it's not our reef tank. I, I just don't yeah. think it's that big of a deal. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't think it's a big of a deal. I mean, <laughs> my, my advice is if you're, if your calcium is above 400, like turn your freaking calcium be ionic down, dose less. Yeah, dude. It. Like, like I mean, yeah. Is 400 what you consider the upper limit on yours? No, I said okay. I was saying that 450 is the max I okay. would let mine That's get better. to. Because the other thing, too, is that the like ESB has trace elements in it. So if you're mm -hmm. super high in something, then it means that you have, a, you know, raised trace elements one way or another. Um, yeah. And again, it's like, I just don't... You always want to be like slightly under or exactly at the the trace amounts you don't want to be above i don't think that it's good to be above especially with those heavy metals you know so um i, I was just gonna say yeah. with the whole um you know adding calcium and alkalinity equally um i've always had to add more alkalinity to my tanks Same. even when mm -hmm. i was running a, a mm -hmm. calcium reactor i still had to dose alkalinity so it was like what's the point of having a calcium reactor if i still have to dose and that's the same thing as, as i'm using two parts like there's way more alkalinity going into there yeah. and i and i look into and, and i look at my icp you know look at the chloride and the sodium and they're a little off they're not horribly off i do do mm -hmm. water changes though um yeah so I, I just you know this whole thing about adding them equally is yeah, it's, it's I don't good. Think if, so. It's good for it's good for a test too, but for our reef tanks, yeah. it doesn't matter that much. Just just do water changes once in a while. And it's not going to get too yeah. far out of hand. Is my is my yeah. opinion. On that. I have never and had the other a tank. Thing too is, oops, every sorry. tank I've ever had has always wanted more elk than the other ones. It's never been an equal yeah. dose for me. Yeah, lacking. I think it totally I makes sense. I think a sense. lot of that yeah. has to do with um, you know, like like uh, carbonate has such a relationship with pH and that whole balance right. and like you know the thing you're actually testing is like this you know conglomeration of these things all working together to give you carbonate hardness yeah. um you know there's so many factors to it so um yeah like co2 in the room right yeah if there's a lot yeah, of co2 totally. that's gonna mm -hmm. that's gonna make carbonic acid acid is gonna react with the buffer and there's gonna be less buffer so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Just, more detritus in your sump, more, just, you know, low flow areas, like all kinds of factors, right? Because like seriously, like almost the whole, well, like a lot of the noobs, they're like, oh, no, I have to add them equally. And it's like, dude, that's, 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 yeah, that's not yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. BS. Yeah. But I, I think there's somebody that could make an argument against us for part of the chemistry. Like somebody was telling me that if you just continue to add them in equal ratios, eventually it will just sort itself out. But I don't know if I buy that. So I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe sometime we'll talk to somebody that you know can make a point for that. But uh, yeah, I can't argue yeah, that because I never me. stuck it out. I just <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Also, I always say I have never really used um, like a pre-made two-part. I always make my own with bulk additives, and um, and I add trace to those bulk additives too. So um, so the cheap way to do it. Okay. So it. Okay, so are you doing all? So Adam, do you use calcium reactors, calc anything, or are you just dosing? Same question for you after Abe. I I, I use it all. I do all okay. of the things. All of the I'm, above. I'm, I'm complicated. I'm, yeah. Me um, <laughs> well, I mean, as a base point, my two big systems have a calcium reactor, and then I have uh, dosing for one of those systems, um, which um, I do use uh, a ratio of. Uh, sodium carbonate to sodium bicarbonate 50 50 um, yep. so I think that most um, alkalinity buffers are uh, are much higher on the um, bicarbonate so they don't boost your pH as much um, and the reason for that is like if you're a person that just doses manually to your tank say you dose your elk once a day 
um, you're going to have, if it was just sodium carbonate, it's going to boost your pH like crazy. But if you have a mix of them, then it's going to just be whatever, 8.3 or whatever you add to your tank. So, um, but I intentionally have made sort of a hyper pH buffering version of my alkalinity to dose. So, uh, so I get like, you know, my pH range is 8.3 to 8.6 kind of thing over the course of the day, which is probably a little more of a swing than I want, but, um, yeah. So anyways, back to what I use. Uh, so I use calc on the tanks as well. Uh, mm -hmm. the calcium reactors come off at night and the calc doses at night. So no calcium reactors on at night at all. Do you have any big swings from that or does it keep it relatively stable? No. Um, I have gotten kind of nerdy with it where I, um, I've kind of changed the schedule of when I dose obviously when the calcium reactor is on and when the calc is on and the mm -hmm. calc is always the same concentration. It's always added at, you know, a rate that is consistent. Um, and I basically got it. So my alkalinity is pretty flat line throughout the day. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody needs to do this. Like it, it's like my system sounds complicated. I'm just doing this to just completely try to optimize. And just cause I enjoy you know, the challenge of being like, how, how close can we get this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. So like, to me, that's kind of, um, yeah. And, and, you know, I can learn from it too. It's like, if I all of a sudden, um, make some changes and I see a bit more of a swing in my elk over the day, uh, will things look worse? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't yeah. matter that much. Maybe about a 0.5 swing in alkalinity over a day is probably totally acceptable. I would say maybe one whole point probably starting to get a little questionable but people can play around with their um like if you're if you're using a doser to add your your two part or three part or whatever um you can play around with that window of when it is dosed mm -hmm. um you know you know play around with it and dose it for the periods of the night or the or the day where the growth is at the most um and uh you know if you have like a alcatronic or a trident and you can test and you really want to kind of learn about when your tank consumes the most just for a little while, put the trident. So it tests 12 times a day, you know, and freaking wastes all your reagents. But, <laughs> um, but then you can learn, you can sort of see when the corals are consuming and you can dose more during those hours. Um, you know, so the only disadvantage I could say to that is if you're doing two part and your two part is helping buffer your pH is if you don't dose at night, your pH might get lower. Yeah. So that's a reason to experiment with calc at night. And then you're starting to get more complicated. All right. What's, what's yeah. your, what's your dosing scheme, Abe? I, I just use a two part. Um, yeah. How I, much? I, use, I have to ask. Uh, you got to use like copious amounts. Lot. Yeah. yeah. Which, which product though? I want to know which product. So uh, for, for the elk, I bake my baking soda. I literally buy 12 pound bags of baking soda. And then so I'll you turn it into soda ash basically you yeah. bake off all the extra co2 yeah yes sir um yeah <laughs> and then for <laughs> calcium i'm actually for i'm actually forced to buy brs calcium chloride mm. it's just because it's it's cleaner I, i'm getting a little paranoid with using these driveway salts there's so much precipitate yeah but but yeah. but really with using those i've never i mean i always got like paranoid but when i switch over to like brs it's like okay there, I don't really see a big difference. So uh, uh, yeah, anyway, my my just two cents because I used to use bulk industrial stuff as well, mm -hmm. and like the beer pharma stuff is obviously much cleaner. But my my big thing on it, if you do water changes, they're, they're going to have impurities, right? If you never sure. do a water change, those impurities will eventually catch up to you. But if you do water changes and you probably dilute it enough, that you'll probably might never have an issue. That's just yeah. kind of my thoughts on the, yeah. the bulk versus the the cleaner. You're probably right. Yeah. But um, I guess because it's hard to say like how much do I really dose because it depends on the concentration, right? But mm -hmm. if, if you took, you know, as much uh, soda ash that can go into a gallon of water without it precipitating, it's yeah. that's how much, that's Max how concentrated, yeah, yeah, that's how concentrated my elk solution is. And in my 120 gallon system, which, which is more, um, I think it's like 260 gallons. I dose mm. 500 mils a day. Yeah. It's a good chunk. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. actually restarted dosing calc at night because I removed my refugium. Mm -hmm. 
which was which was used to be run at night. So my pH dropped when I did that. And uh, yeah, that's why I restarted mm-hmm. calc. But even with that, I'm yeah. still dosing 500 mils of two part. Now, did yeah. you remove your fuge because your nutrients were super low? That was at the driver. I or? did. Yeah. Um, my tank did hit it. Well, yeah, I think my tanks finally hit a point where the corals started to look like they weren't getting enough nutrients. Mm-hmm. Um, but this was after like two years of being like heavy and heavy out, or maybe yeah. even longer than that. You know, not even measuring my nutrients. Mm-hmm. Um, but after a while, yeah. So I decided I started dosing nitrate, and then after a while, I was like, "Why am I doing this? Just remove one of the you know nutrient Explore exports." Less. Yeah. Yeah. And so I decided to do the fusion. Mm-hmm. But then when I did that, I was like, oh, crap, no, my pH is dipping late at <laughs> night. So I added calc back on. I'm just like, can't win. No, but. Uh, How are you doing calc? Are you doing just the concentrated kind of, you're not doing slurry, like, or are you doing just like a. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, I'm, do, I'm doing a slurry. I'm not, I'm not doing the okay. normal saturated. Yeah, I'm doing a slurry. Um, yeah. Okay. It's just easier. Yeah. Are you yeah. using a yeah, calc I mean, reactor I, or what are you doing? Do, I, yes, yeah, it's, it's like a DIY calc reactor. It's like a, mm-hmm. um, you know, just a plastic container with a float valve in there to replenish the RODI. Yep. And then there's a pump in there to mix it all up. And when it's time to Perfect. dose, the pump turns on, and then a dosing pump just adds yeah. it to the tank. Yeah. Perfect. Nice, nice and easy. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm doing a like the uh, six grams per gallon uh, concentration. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it is. Yeah. And and it, and it's nice because I feel like it's very safe because. Yeah. Uh, the concentration, well, for one, it all it pretty much all dissolves. Like, I think I mix 15 gallons at a time, and I hardly have any uh, extra left over at the bottom of the, of the reservoir. So it, it's almost all getting saturated into the water. Um, and then, yeah, I just feel like if something was to sort of stick on or I was to get an overdose, it wouldn't be as dangerous as doing something more concentrated but um mm-hmm. there's all kinds of things you can do to avoid these things right like you can set like rules in, in an apex to say if ph in the tank goes above 8.6 like turn off all of this shit you know <laughs> so there's ways to just kind of safety um be be safe about using calc because yeah you don't want some major major influx of it definitely i do think though that calc is uh pretty forgiving it's yeah. it's not as it's not as yeah. bad as like straight dosing calc and that being overdosed, you know? Mm-hmm. Calc is yeah. a lot more forgiving. So if you overdose yeah. calc, there is some room to play. You don't need to freak out or whatever. Cuz calc mm-hmm. doesn't really do much. Well, in terms of alkalinity level, calc doesn't really mess with my level that much. It's it's more of me dosing the two part that changes my alkalinity. So that's why I'm okay dosing a slurry is because it's it doesn't really, it just helps the pH for me. At yeah. Least. And it's also not your primary uh, yeah. uh, macro, you know, uh, replacement. So, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people could consider adding like a calc, uh, you know, option to their system just as like a, you know, little boost thing that is in addition to what they do. Um, and another thing about calc is it, it's, it's supposedly it does um uh, bind and precipitate phosphates um Mm -hmm. so if you do have high phosphates um calc might help for that and it might also be one of the reasons that i have to add more phosphates because i've been dosing calc so um you know unfortunately like you know sometimes something that gives you a benefit gives you a little bit of a negative at the same time but i'd say it's for the most part is worth it so less gfo more calc Yeah. So, Abe, have you noticed since you took off this um, algae reactor and added the calc option, have things looked better, like, overall? Like, how long has it been? Oh, it's been probably at least three months. But um, I would say, because I I started messing with nitrate dosing first, and then, um, you know, I just decided to not do that. And then I just took the, I stopped the nitrate dosing and just took off the fuge. Mm-hmm. And uh, my results are better um, with the fuge off, not with the nitrate dosing. So definitely mm-hmm. the more natural approach. And it's great because yeah. I get to keep it simple and have less shit in my system. <laughs> and I think... Um, Except I added kelp. Yeah. Yeah, but the fuge would have been consuming uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in, the, in, a, in a proper ratio. So by removing yeah. it, you're essentially keeping the ratio... Um, the same, whereas you start trying to add just nitrate on its own or phosphate on its own or try to guess on the, you know, the that what to add ratio. I mean, that's a hard thing to figure out. Um, 
yeah, you're probably safer just removing that fuge. It makes sense yeah. to me, you know. And then it just brings back that whole conversation of okay, are the um, are, are is the algae is the Cato taking up some are competing with the so for some of the trace elements? So for I sure think it, it was it was a good it was a good. Um, I guess I'm not too surprised that taking off yeah. the fuge was a better um, solution than dosing nitrates. Yeah, and it yeah. is going to suck out your trace elements. Like I even I know algae scrubbers like Carolgy. Mm -hmm. That sucks out like tons of trace elements. So it is can it can be counterproductive, especially if you're are dosing trace and paying more attention to some of those things. But yeah, I yeah. mean, rather than dosing more, just export less as a simpler and cheaper solution for a lot of people. Yep. Mm -hmm. So okay, so Adam, you're obviously chasing the high pH train. Abe, do you pay attention to pH very much? <laughs> I I just uh, want the oh sorry, go ahead. No, my question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. Uh, I, I don't are. know if you I, know you are. I, I, I guess I you guess are. chasing. I hate saying chasing. <laughs> um, I have been paying more attention to and uh, making an effort to keep an elevated pH level to see yep. if it makes my corals happier. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I do think that things grow faster. I, I don't think that's even like disputable. It's like it, you know, corals at a higher pH scientifically grow faster. Um, so, you know, why not try to get it higher? And, and I, I also think that like, I've talked about this before with you, like, I think the bad mojo and the bad stuff in the tank happens, uh, at, at those low pH dips. I think that's when those like nastier bacteria and, you know, RTN and, and, uh, you know, brown jelly, they have a better chance of cultivating in that more acidic environment. They, they thrive in those environments more. So why not just keep your base level of your pH higher? I, I think it's a good point. And I, and I, yeah. I think that you're right about that. Um, cause you, cause you specifically, when you told me about that, you said that, you know, overnight is when corals RTN, right? And you, that's why totally. you suspect yeah. it's the pH. And I was like, oh, sh you might be right. Um, so I do suspect that's correct. Um, it's just, yeah, I don't know though. I do suspect it's correct. Um, as far yeah, as yeah. for like chasing pH, um, I don't really chase a specific pH, but I do want to stay above eight overnight. That's generally where I'm at. Like I'm not chasing yeah. like 8.4 stable, you know, stable at 8.4, whatever. Like I'm not at that point yet. I don't know if it's that important because, yeah. um, you know, higher pH will, um, cause or will help will facilitate the bonding of calcium and carbonate in a test tube. Mm -hmm. But that's in a test tube. Our corals put mm -hmm. those things together through an enzymatic reaction. So can you really, yeah. no doubt, I'm not denying that higher pH will increase growth and calcification, but can you really say there's a difference between 8.3 and 8.45? Like, I don't, I don't know if yeah, we know for sure. No, it's kind of like the uh, elevated nutrient thing. You're just ensuring a better chance that that reaction will occur uh, properly, you know, yeah. and, and you're right. It's like a coral when it, the pH inside of the coral is actually very different than it is outside of the coral. Like it, right. it's doing chemistry and it's doing things in there, uh, you know, where maybe the outside pH isn't as much of a factor as we think when the actual growth is occurring. I just mm -hmm. think extremely low has got to be bad. Yeah, I, I you know. agree. I agree on that one. Yeah. Go ahead, Devin. You talk. Tell us. Tell us your side. You haven't been saying much. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I do agree. I was down the super duper rabbit hole chasing it, but again, I'm not growing corals to frag and sell, and now my corals are almost growing too much. So I'm like, ah, should I, should I yeah. stop caring about pH so it slows it down a little bit? But I do heavily agree on the fact of you know eight ish or higher is healthier for your system. You know, even 7.9, I'm not too worried, but when it's like 7.7, 7.8, that's the point where I'm like, okay, I, I want it higher just for like the health of the coral, the health of the system. And I do agree that depressed pH is more likely for bad stuff to happen than at a slightly elevated level. Um, so yeah. almost for that perspective, I think it is beneficial to have that, you know, eight or higher, ideally. Um, now at nighttime, I mean, if my skimmer's off, my pH freaking tanks like crazy. Like it is insane the difference of it. So I, I know earlier we talked about turning your skimmer off for part of the time, and that's something that I just can't do because I rely on it so much heavily for aeration and pH. Um, hmm. 
Calibrate your pH. And I only I only yeah. do it during True. the pH peak of my day, so it's yeah. not. Um, and I, I actually found that it didn't affect the high very much. Mm-hmm. I was actually uh, worried that my pH high was going to be too much of a swing from the low. So I thought that by having the skimmer come off, it might actually level it out, and it hardly changed. Because yeah. um, when when as you as the day goes on and the corals are growing and the corals are consuming um, uh, carb, 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 like carb, carbonate, um, y- there's less to go around anyway. So your you know your skimmer is not going to you know do you say your CO2 scrubber media is not going to work as hard anyways. Um, but that has been the other benefit is my CO2 scrubber media has lasted like now it lasts me like two two and a half months, and I'll change do, it. Do so. you recirculate it? I recirculate it, yeah. Yeah, that that adds quite a bit to it as well. But it, Devin, it, um, you were, uh, what were your pH? Because I mean, we were talking about this a while back, and your pH was just you're kind of struggling to get it into the kind of you know Goldilocks I, zone. Yeah, I'm is still it struggling. Still, like, what's the, what's the range now? It, it is currently eight point oh seven, which is crap. Uh, <laughs> but but it was, yeah, yeah. that's not that's not great for five. 26 p.m you know oh, that, yeah. that's a pretty peak time yeah and it was down to like 7.8 last night which is too low like 7.9 i'd be okay 7.8 that's too low which probably means that i should replace my media on top to get that extra 0.1 boost out of it but Devin had you had so many videos on ph <laughs> oh i had it super high for You're a like while the... okay <laughs> Oh yeah, I I had it like eight point three plus for ages, and then, but now like everything's growing together. It's starting to like touch the glass constantly. I'm like, okay, you guys can slow down. So I, so I don't care as much anymore. I just want to get rid of my lows. That's pretty much all I care about. Right yeah. I'm happy. Well, what were, there was a, a couple things I suggested to you. One was um, to top up your calcium reactor um, so that, that the chamber. Yeah, I don't know if that made much of a difference, but I mean, I think uh, being more on top of that helps because the more the more uh, saturated uh, that CO2 or calcium reactor is with with CO2 and just mm-hmm. water versus actual media, it just means you're just yeah. pumping more and more CO2 into that. And then whatever's coming out is probably going to be more rich in CO2. So, so um, but you didn't notice a big difference. No, I mean, a little bit. But here's the thing, though, because my tank has grown a lot more. I've, you know, at the time, a few, you know, six months ago, I was dosing like 50 mils of my calcium reactor of effluent. Now I'm up to like 75, 80 mils. So I'm also dosing way more of that high yeah, CO2 water. So I yeah. love calcium reactors. They are dirt cheap to run. Like, you, you know, you refill that with media and CO2. It is so much cheaper than dosing. However, the downfall is you're dosing CO2 laden water to your tank. And that's always the downfall. Yeah. So, I mean, realistically, I could just dose more and use less calcium reactor, but the calcium reactor does most of the heavy lifting. And I think my doser doses like 40 mils of alk on top of that just to keep the balance. But yeah. And I also and, dose uh, calc every day, 24 7 trip of calc. So, what did we talk about? What were you using for your uh, alkalinity that you dose on top of that? What are you, what are you using? Uh, what am I using? I was using Brightwell or BRS Pharma. It's just whatever one I mix up. Because mm-hmm. that's the thing I was saying with if you're using just uh, sodium carbonate, soda ash, mm-hmm. then you'll get a much better pH benefit out of it. Are you using, what What are you using? Is it uh, a blend or is it? I will tell you next time I mix them up. Yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. a few random ones. It's whatever one I grab. You, if you want to dose a little bit on top of a calcium reactor just to get yeah. more of a pH benefit, then just mm-hmm. dose sodium carbonate. And now, to, that should help. Now, the other bit of fun is I also dose... Or baked baking soda. I also do probably six liters of calc drip through my tank a day. So I drip calc 24-7. Um, I basically don't even use an ATO anymore. I just... Whatever I evaporate is what how much... I, yeah, calcwasser I dose. It's just a constant trip, twenty four seven to my tank. So awesome. I just have too many big fish in my tank. Really, that's what it comes down to. There's just too many big mouse breathing CO two. So you have more yeah, than thirty percent of your fish, or forty percent, are big. Yeah, probably. I have yeah three yellow tangs, a purple tang, a really big blue regal tang. Uh, big sailfin tang plus a bazillion other fish. I just have too many big fish. That's really what it comes down to. This is the downfall of overstocking large fish in your tank. That's a lot of CO2 breathers in there. 
yeah. yeah. I think the other thing to try too, and I don't know if we talk about this, is uh, something I do about twice a year is I take all the, I have a lot of rock rubble in my sumps. That's like part mm-hmm. of my, essentially, because they're frag tanks with um, no live rock in them. So the live rock's all in the sump. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll take all the rock out and, and do a water change and I blast all the rock and get all the detritus off of it. And um, getting all the detritus out potentially could help your pH as well. I don't know how, what your sump situation's like, but... Um, a, a thought you know, yeah. that just popped up to my head as you said that. I have a bunch of those little bio block things in there that my water flows through, which is going to yeah. be full of bacteria, which bacteria yeah. also breathe right? They also consume yeah. oxygen and put out CO2. So if you have a ton of biomedia, that could potentially be adding the CO2. I'm almost kind of curious to pull it out for a night and see if there's a difference. Yeah, I, I mean, I think some, but that uh, bacteria is like anaerobic bacteria for the most part, right? Like that's, you know, thriving in a yeah. non-oxygenated environment for the most part. I don't it's, know. It's still both. Uh, if your water's being forced through, that's, out of my, that's a blend. Yeah, I, I would say it's element. probably both. This. Yeah. I also wonder with those bio brick type style nutrient, um, uh, you know, surface based uh, uh, media, like how many years are they actually good for? Like, should they be replaced versus live rock? I feel like is kind of good for for essentially forever if it's in a healthy system. But is there um, a difference? Uh, what's that... your Abe? Have you used those like, um, you know, porous kind of like live rock supplement, like some kind of the bio brick kind of style? Not the brick. I did have Siporax in my tank at one mm-hmm. point. Yeah. I, I took it. I don't know. I don't think it does anything. It's, yeah. Okay. I, I guess my reasoning was I have a lot of live rock in my displays. Like, I yeah. don't really need this. And and plus, it got yeah. nasty. So I was like, I don't want to clean this stuff or keep yeah, replacing it's, part it's of another... it. It's another detritus trap for sure. Yeah. And if detritus, uh, you know, suppresses pH, then... It's That's just another point. way to kind of uh, collect it. But All so, right. Devin, what is your sump situation? How, you, how you, clean is it? Not clean <laughs> enough. You've inspired me to clean it through this whole talk. Um, <laughs> okay. I will agree. Well, and, uh, yeah. Something I just want to point out for people watching, you guys both have very low nutrients, and you're also saying that you didn't notice a whole lot from like the zipper axe and pulled it out. Now, that is going to be denitrifying bacteria. So a lot of people who are dosing nitrates and stuff, like yank out that media that is sucking down your nitrates because that is also going to help you raise it. I'm um, just this popped to my head. I just want to point that one out. Especially if you're struggling for nutrients, like pull out some of that stuff, because that's all denitrifying bacteria playground. So good for thought. Hmm. But I'm not sure. Okay. I guess the thing is that um, the denitrifying bacteria, these are the bacteria that um, convert nitrate to uh, molecular or not molecular, but N2, right? Mm-hmm. Those, I think, are anaerobic, right? So, I mean, that's the whole reason for, like, DSBs back then and for, like, plenums. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. So, yeah, that's true if you have a bunch of anaerobic zones in your within your media or your sump or whatever, but I, I'm not sure. Anyway. Well, if you mm-hmm. think about the density of it, that stuff's going to be, like, what's in the middle of that media, right? Where the... Okay anaerobic or whatever you call it sorry i'm tired anyways um so your your low oxygen zone is going to be in the center of your media where the outside stuff that's more porous is going to be whatever the other type is um so it's going to be a mix of your it within your media density and over time as it gets filled with like bulb and other stuff again that's going to be less oxygen and water flow through as well and i i've seen people pull those uh bio bricks out and they just like reek like sulfur you know, they'll break them, they break, sometimes they crumble and break apart and they reek like sulfur and uh, that's not good. That's definitely not good. I mean, we know like raised hey, sulfite sulfur levels in the tank are, are <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, no, but we don't want to mess with that stuff. I like, there was a comment here by uh, Bird Minshew. He says, there, there's no such thing as a master reefer. And I was thinking that when you first, you called us masters, <laughs> I was like, nobody's a master. You can never be a master reefer. Yeah. You can be. You, know. you can be good, but if you claim to know it all, <laughs> you you're lying. Be, yeah. No one's ever going to know it yes, all. We're all always learning. True. Yeah, this yeah. hobby has a way of humbling you. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. so true. Okay, Reef with me. Can you ask them if there's such a thing as too many water changes? I would say only to hurt your pocketbook. 
you're never going to hurt a tank by doing water changes unless you're using a salt that's like vastly different and you cause some big crazy swings. But anyway, sorry, you guys go. I ahead. think I, I would say that you can if your tank is bottomed out nutrients and it's a young tank. I don't think you should yeah. do too many uh, water changes on a new system. Like, because like I was talking about earlier, a new system is full of, full of frags. Yep. Um, with a bunch of water in it, it's going to have a pretty good, uh, you know, trace element um, profile. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree. Low when yeah. you start a new tank, you don't really need to do water changes that much. Yeah. You don't need to, but if your tank's a year old, is it possible to do too many water changes? I don't think it is. I think you're just wasting your money, but I don't think it would hurt, yeah. hurt anything. I, yeah, I, I mean, I you're agree pulling with out Adam. nutrients every time you do that. You are pulling on nutrients every time, so you have to be careful with that. I, I've definitely seen people that they'll send me a message and they'll be like, here's how I've been doing my tank. And it's like a young tank and like everything. There's no algae. Everything's super stark. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's like, it, you know, they put a coral in and it, do and it doesn't live. And it's like, it's and they're like, yeah, well, but it should be healthy, right? I'm doing water changes every week. It's like, dude, stop wasting your time <laughs> and your money. So, yeah, no, I think there's a time and a place for more water changes for sure. Fair. And and probably the opposite is true. Is like it, the more mature your tank is, you know, obviously if you don't have uh, uh, low nutrients, maybe the more water changes, the better. I don't know. I think I could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't know. I I think I can agree with that, especially in a system that just is constantly has a, a nutrient in influx, um, you know, and a bunch of fish, like it's, and and yeah. low trace elements too. Hey, yeah. if I live by the ocean, <laughs> I'd have a really long pipe and a pump out in the ocean doing a constant water change. <laughs> I really liked uh, there was uh, the guest that was just on uh, Reef from the Australian. Uh, oh, why I can't, I can't remember her name now. Sorry. Uh, she was saying that they they sell they go and bring in water and they sell it. So a lot yeah. of Australian reefers just get to like, you know. And she was like, there was this gas station that was for sale, and she's like, we're thinking about buying it and then just setting up so you could pull up and fill up your water <laughs> reservoir and drive off like a gas station. <laughs> that would have been sweet. Okay, so, yeah, so I mean, if yeah. you live by the ocean, would you? Well, you do live by the ocean. If you live by a tropical ocean, would you use one. ocean water, or would you use? I think synthetic? you have to collect it. It depends on where Offshore. it's collected from. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, Abe's in California, so same kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I've I've heard of people. Um, like like I'm on Vancouver Island. Like, there's people that have uh, fish only tanks that will uh, collect salt water mm -hmm. um from around here but the composition is a little different to you like i think it's lower in calcium uh yeah there's certain things that are a little different yeah water you know yeah it's low in calcium it's not like horribly low but it's low it's like below 400 it's low in mag i think mag is like below 1200 this is off the coast of san diego um those are the main ones. The salinity is a little low too, or I should say the specific gravity is more like 1.024. There are some mm -hmm. differences, but um, we do have a unique, I don't know if it's unique, but we do have this situation in San Diego where we have the Scripps Institute of Oceanography here, mm -hmm. and, and they have the Birch Aquarium, and they do all their research and all that stuff, and they have a pipe that extends into the ocean, and you know that's where they get their water from, and they actually share that water with us. So us reefers in mm -hmm. San Diego can drive up to a spout and take ocean water, you know. That's not offshore. It's kind of it's kind of out there, yeah. I think. And uh, so so we're yeah. we're definitely familiar with that uh, type of water. Have you ever used it in your tank? That's cool. Or or yes. would you? Yeah. Yeah. No. Do you I've think I've experimented with it, and I've got an ICP test on it too. What? Yeah. Oh, really? was your findings like is it something do you think there's benefit to using it do you think you're risking bringing in nasties with it like what's your thoughts i think it's i think it's fine for fish only tanks and lps and you'll probably be like okay with sps but mm -hmm. in my experience you get better results with synthetic synthetic salt okay yeah yeah yeah, I, yeah, it might be a different case in australia though because i mean oh, the Great totally. Barrier reef is oh, right yeah. there and, yeah, yeah yeah you know so um, how cool would that be though? You know, it's like, you don't have to like spend all this money on a, on a bucket of salt. You don't have to purify all the RO to do it. Your only RO is for your top off. You mm -hmm. know, I, I like the idea of that. It's a little more manual labor, I suppose, because you have to go pick it up. But, um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it, it would be nice. If, if there's I any was... Aussie reefers in the chat. 
if I was setting up a new tank, I would potentially try it because I think it may give you some goodness in the cycling perspective. I totally would start with that water too, if you could. Yeah. And there's yeah. like bacteria yeah. floating in there. It is filtered what yeah. we get. But um, yeah, that, that that would be the best thing. I, I do feel like it'd be, yeah. for me, being a lazy reefer, it'd be too much effort to go pick it up every time versus just making my own. So from a lazy perspective, I, I think I would rather just use synthetic. But for doing an initial new tank, I, I do think there's probably some benefit there. Yeah. 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 These are all Abe's pretty corals above me for the record. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've been tempted before, honestly, uh, when I brought in uh, shipments from overseas and everything's really, really clean and the corals are clean in the bags, like putting a little bit of that water in my tank. Like, I, I you know, you can argue like, oh, you might introduce something you don't want, but it's like, you know, put a little bit of that in the sump. There's probably some bacteria, but I think it's more likely that, say, if they're, you know, you're bringing in corals, those mariculture bases are going to have some of that good bacteria on them as well. Yeah. Um, you know, but... You know, unfortunately, I've kind of made the decision in the past, um, you know, six months to a year. I just immediately just cut cut the base and and remount, um, just because it's just it's just too hard to see anything that there could be any eggs or anything on there. Yeah, that's definitely so. the a big thing. I used to be the same way. Like I was putting everything. I'm like the more diversity, the better. But now I'm terrified of like yeah. flatworms or any other little pests that could potentially make it in your system. Yeah. Yeah. Super not cool. When it gave new corals, is the whole thing going in or do you frag off bases? Oh, no, I frag off bases. Yeah. 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 Um, but I have a quarantine tank too. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a perfect world. Ideal way to go is throw any new coral in quarantine and make sure it's safe. But not many of us do that. You guys both do because yeah. you have big systems and you're a better man than I. But it's awesome. <laughs> It is definitely the the way to go if you can. Yeah. Yeah. And it sucks because sometimes like a mariculture piece comes in and it's like, it just, you can't really get it off the base without sort of ruining it. And you're just like, oh, like it's so <laughs> nice looking. It looks clean. It's like, I don't want to freaking cut this thing off. I know it's never going to look the same, but yeah, it's the, the best way to ensure. But uh, yeah. Um, Abe, do you, does your QT system, is it plumbed into the main one or is it its own? It's, it's its own yeah yeah because i've wondered about that before where i've been like well if it's a qt system and it's like um overflow is going through a filter sock and it's like you know it has to go through all of these chambers and a skimmer and all of these things before it gets into the main tank it's like what are the chances of oh and say there's a uv too that might maybe zaps any you know anything that's in the actual water column um I don't know, like, could you have a QT that's attached to your main system? Um, anyways, um, my little method that I did actually recently is I, uh, I have a little um, kind of cube tank that's hooked up to one of my systems, and I filled it with uh, peppermint shrimp. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. basically anything that goes through there, these peppermint shrimp just go over it all. And when you get enough of them in a small concentrated area versus a a tank where there's all i'm sure like in a big display tank or a big system there's tons of things for them to pick out and eat but if you just have them yeah. isolated in a little tank they're going to eat all the nudibranchs and flatworms and, and crap on there so um yeah. it's kind of like the uh the biological uh uh version of the the qt system where you just kind of like you know you know get those shrimp at it um specifically actually the ones from jakarta are the best the the, uh, the species is a little different than the yeah. regular peppermint i think they're called uh uh quack quack and thally peppermints I'm, I'm pretty sure chris is the exact same thing because i remember having this conversation with him about a very similar mm -hmm. thing i so. think he talked about uh the ones from florida that he got were the were the yeah the real killers so yeah, not all peppermints are are created equal. Some of them are more timid, and some of them are mm -hmm. just like ferocious. I, I find so. too though with peppermints, like they do better in groups. They're more aggressive in groups. Where on their own, they hide more. Yeah, but just in a tank with yeah. some friends, you're probably safe. I agree. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Now, on your system, Abe, with your separated one, do you pay attention to testing and dosing and everything on it, or you just throw some corals on there and? come back in a few weeks and if it's alive and healthy you throw it in your tank what do you do i yeah i don't i don't pay a lot of attention <laughs> mainly salinity i do do water changes and i root that's yep. the thing is i have a skimmer 
I try to mm. remove detritus as often as possible. I do water changes. Yeah, that's pretty much all I do. I don't really test, yeah. except that's for right. salinity. Um, because there's not a lot of coral in there. And if, yeah. you know, if I do water change in there, it's probably going to be similar to that. So. Mm -hmm. It's on. The only okay. time I actually test salinity is when I bring in uh, a shipment because I know that the ocean water is generally going to be, well, okay. Yeah, let's say fish fish systems in these these exporters, they keep them generally at a much lower um, salinity. So you want to watch out for that. But I think the coral systems are generally, uh, especially in Indo, they're going to be just ocean water. So it's going to be pretty much like proper ocean salinity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always test the salinity of stuff before I put it in my tank and then I test my tank and I just make sure that they're, you know, super, super close. Yeah. And if for some reason they were wildly different, then they have to be like, okay, maybe I'll calibrate my refractometer. I'll check a couple of things just to be sure. Um, but they never are. So. I, I was just giving it a bit of thought. If I was to plumb, this would be probably a, a lot more effort to maintain it. But if I was to plumb a QT system into like your main system, I would have it a like lower flow run through UV to make sure it just like annihilates anything in the water mm -hmm. column. And yeah. I'd probably also run it through like one of those big 20 inch, like a one or five micron sediment filter. It'd be a pain to change them mm -hmm. every couple of weeks, but then that would literally tr kill off anything that was live through UV at low yeah. flow. And it would also capture basically any tiny little particulates that could be a pass to making it through, right? If you have like a one yeah. micron, but I do like the big 20 inch one that will actually last a while, but it, it'd be a bit of a pain to change it. But at least you don't have to worry about yeah. dosing and salinity and everything else. So that would be my method. Yeah, I think, it, I I think pondering it's possible it. to have a, a, a QT that's plum, plumbed in. So if you, uh, you know, if you end up doing that, um, yeah, let me know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I doubt I will, but that's what, that's what yeah. I would do. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so so this, I just asked Dan what it was, but his comment, we do the whole kite out the basing, but the really bad stuff is on the curl, not the base. Oh, Monty Dean. Yeah, Monty Dean needs our pain. Those guys aren't really base specific. But. Yeah. Yeah, I got to say, though, uh, I don't know who from Tidal Gardens is, is chatting there, but it's nice to have them here. Um, mm -hmm. I swear those peppermint shrimp eat moth eating nudies and flatworms, the, mm -hmm. the quack and thalli, lys lysathema or whatever, whatever the species is. They, those are, uh, they those eat are the magic? I, I think so, yeah. And unfortunately, uh, sort of out of season right now. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, if it were up to me, I would have 100 in all my tanks. <laughs> Just <throw> 100 in <laughs> You're now, like, I, I guess the other question is, have they picked on any of your corals or have you had any issues with that? Uh, I don't know. Like I, like I was saying, I had that system that I basically used as my QT and I would just throw, I would just put the acros uh, after I landed them. Actually, I land the acros, I put them in the LPS system that doesn't have acros, mm -hmm. not dip them in the first day, just let them settle. Uh, and then I would move them to that system and uh let the peppermint shrimp just go to town on them and then yeah. after that replace them and add them to the other system okay so uh, okay. It, it's like a basically like a fast forwarded version of qt because uh nothing even gets a chance to develop um, yeah so okay i, I just yeah. want to quickly check in i just realized this has been a crazy long live stream so far do any guys got to run or do we want to call her soon I, I going. Just ran, uh, I just went to the okay do you, do you want to yeah. keep going or do you want yeah. to call it? I don't want to take up your guys' whole night, but oh, it's also oh, a good random chat. So I'm okay to keep going, but uh, it just depends on what we're uh, – <laughs> anything good in the chat we want to address? or I'm okay to keep going too. I do yeah. find it super yeah. cool that there's still 197 people <laughs> watching. So maybe maybe they want to keep going too. Maybe they have a vote. Okay. Um, yeah. There, there's been lots of questions that I probably missed, so just do like the at thing in Refutes and ask it again so it highlights it, and I will definitely hit your questions up if there's anything yeah. pressing that you guys want us to touch on. Yeah, I don't know. Did we talk about nutrients enough? I don't really know where else uh, <laughs> I, I don't we can think go we with did, it. did, man. But... Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, sometimes we have a subject that we, we put in the title and we're just like, oh, cool, we talked about that for 10 minutes and we talked about a million other things, but... <laughs> it's, a, it's a loose um, subject. What? I, yeah, yeah I, well, I agree with that. I find like nutrients these days is a difficult topic. To me, it's mm -hmm. like talking about religion or politics. It's like everybody's going to have their own view. You're not going to convince them otherwise, you know, because they have experience. And it's just mm -hmm. to, me, to me, it's kind of a delicate topic. But at yeah. the same time, I still think that 
if your nitrates are around five or your phosphates are around 0 0.05, stop blaming your nutrients on anything. Yeah. <laughs> That's the safe spot yeah. to be. So, so you, you guys are much yeah. lower, like in my mind, because you guys are much lower than me. In my mind, like 0 0.03 to 0 0.09, I'm happy for PO4. In nitrates, like anything from like two to 20, I don't care. Anything in that range, I'm happy. Like that's kind of like my yeah. general thoughts, but you guys both seem yeah, like and you're I mean, both you're much still, lower. You're still not that far off from the ratio though. Like, um, mm -hmm. yeah, which I think is again, probably the most kind of important thing to keep in mind because if that was reversed and your, you know, your nitrates were one and your, I don't know, phosphate was like, I don't know, two, <laughs> like your, your tank would probably be dead. Your acros would probably all brown out, you mm -hmm. know, uh, things wouldn't be able to grow properly. Um, but I have heard some people say that, uh, you know, some super like he heavyweight type, you know, people in the industry say that um, they will go for like a 10 to one ratio for, for nutrients, um, you mm -hmm. know, even recommend it. So, um, but I think I can say for like, you know, Abe and I both talked about this is um, our corals are dark, like they're rich and dark in color at, yeah. You know just low traceable amounts and i can't say that anything was darker or richer when my nitrate was 25 you know wow. like i can't say that it necessarily looked better i just think that those nutrients are getting pulled in by the coral and utilized and and it's just going to do what it does like maybe oh. some people can make the argument oh i had the same coral uh under five nitrate and i had then i got it to 20 nitrates and it looked way better Mm. It's like, uh, I don't know, maybe it's possible. So 5 to opinion. 20 or 25, no no big difference is what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that um, it's all you're doing is you're ensuring that nitrates are available for the coral to use. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as like, you know, if you're, you want to talk about like, what's the optimal calcium level? It's like, well, the coral is not like, like, oh, like, uh, yeah, I'm not really going to grow today because like, you know, the calcium is 390 and it's just kind of like, you know, I just just not really feeling it today, so I'm just I'm uh, not gonna grow. <laughs> uh, I'm more of a 420 kind of coral, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like corals are yeah. really good at finding those macro elements. Like they'll mm -hmm. find them, they'll suck them up and grow. Like you have to be like super deficient in calcium, I think, for corals to start to really, really decrease in growth rate. I don't think a coral is gonna grow faster with a calcium level of 450 than it is a calcium level of say 410 or 420. But now I agree with you, but I feel like somebody said that because I have some reefers telling me that I'm like, where did this come from? Did did somebody say that? It's like, oh, better, better growth rates with calcium at 460. Did somebody say that that I don't know? Of? Well, I don't know if there's any truth to this, but I've also heard too high a calcium could be potentially slow growth a bit. I don't I've never ex noticed a difference I, I think personally, so. but. Well, I think yeah. that the, it's all about that ionic balance, too. And it's like, mm -hmm. at the same time, you also don't want a really, really highly elevated magnesium. It's like all, all of these things like exist in nature in the balance that they're at, you know, for a reason. And the reason that, you know, coral reefs in nature are successful is based around that model. I mean, one thing we play around with is we do raise our alkalinity. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, like a lot of tanks have lower pH, like we were talking about too. So it's that whole dynamic is like maybe one of the reasons we run higher alkalinity is because of our, um, you know, deficiencies in pH stability. Um, I don't know, but uh, yeah, fair. yeah. What were we talking about? Where? How do we get here? Okay, I don't know. Okay, uh, okay. A few <laughs> chat questions. James Scott, what's the best way to balance nutrients? Um, if you're deficient on one. I mean, you could obviously just dose it directly or feed more. Um, if you're crazy high levels, I mean, obviously you do a big water chain is going to cut it down. I generally find if it's sometimes easier to target something specific, like GFO or roll of phosphorus, for instance, knock down PO4. Um, if you're targeting nitrate, usually it's more something like carbon dosing or there's other, I guess they're all carbon dosing, basically the target nitrates. But generally you want to get whatever method for me i always struggle with high phosphate um probably just because i feed like a, with a shovel on my tank so nitrates usually isn't an issue for me but it's usually phosphate so i gotta run something like rofos to keep it in check and i probably only change like abe you said you like never take it out i don't either i don't see why you would take it out i just leave it in and tell my 
phosphates are creeping up. I'm like, oh, it's time to change it again. So I probably only change it every like six to eight weeks, but it's in there 24 seven until I need to change it. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. So like, I, I would agree, like the best position to be in is when your nutrients are actually a bit on the low side, because it's easier to add it than it is to take it away. It's easier yeah. to add it at a calculated amount, you know, versus removing it. But all of these sources to remove it are, I don't know, like you, I, I don't think a bottle can tell you like, add this much no box and it will remove uh, this much phosphate and this much nitrate. Like there's too many variables for it for you to actually say that mm -hmm. will actually do exactly yeah. that thing. And not to say it's not going to remove some, it definitely will. It's just like, there's so many other factors to the chemistry mm -hmm. that I think play into it. Yeah. Now, yeah. one I didn't touch on, there is stuff like lanthium chloride for phosphate. I've always been hesitant mm -hmm. on that one just because I know it, it binds phosphates and they'll be in your water yeah. and those little tiny particles can affect certain fish's gills and cause other issues so i've always been hesitant yeah. to use it if i was going to do it i would dose it into a very fine sock or filter roller or into my skimmer so it binds in the reaction chamber i find i have tried dosing the skimmer i find it's not quite as effective but i also feel it's safer doing it that way so i generally yeah. just stick to gfo style yeah um yeah lanthanum chloride i used to use it years ago um and not like I've ever had a lot of problem with raised phosphates, but it does definitely work. I just, yeah, at this point in time, I would rather try to find, make little changes to the biology of the tank and mm -hmm. with the equipment, with the actual, um, you know, uh, what's the way of putting it? Like the things like the skimmer, adjusting the skimmer, doing water changes, like those more physical aspects um, yeah. rather than using a chemical like that, for sure. Yeah. And then... If the other thought I have too is if you are really low and you need to up your nutrients, like I always initially to say feed more, but export less, right? If you're not struggling yeah. for pH, run your skimmer 12 hours instead of 24, you know, if your refugium's yeah, on sense. for 12 hours, cut it down to six hours. Like there's lots of things that you can just tweak by exporting less to raise it rather than trying to, you know, dumping in more bottles of stuff into your totally. tank. So other food for thought. Yeah. Um, the, opposite, and the opposite nice. is true too with people who yeah. have um, too high nutrients it's like look at what you're putting into your tank like I said earlier people Stop put all kinds of stuff into their tank I'm telling you man and it's like it, it's it's the dime a dozen when people are like I have high nutrients and they're adding all this stuff so you really gotta look at yourself I don't it's, know. it's true I mean yeah. you could feed pellets instead of frozen food that you don't rinse like me but there, there's all different considerations it's, it's really it's not even like <laughs> fish food it's it's yeah. like all these magical things it's like phyto it's like oyster feasts it's like reefroids yeah it's it's not it's not regular fish food it's all this like all these magical yeah. products is my argument so anyway yeah yeah totally okay. i think uh yeah you just look at look at your feeding yeah. for sure if you have oh yeah nutrients for sure. Okay, juice. When dosing kelk, how do you keep track of trace elements? How do you test for them? What do you do dose a supplement? If you are not okay, it doesn't matter what you're dosing, if it's kelk or two slash three slash four, whatever part, or calcium actor. Um if you are doing regular water changes, you are getting some trace elements back into your system. You're likely not getting full trace elements back. If you are going to go down the ICP route and test once in a while, then I see it a more viable thing to chasing that rabbit hole. If you are not going to ever do an ICP test, I think taking something and you do want to pay a little more attention to trace elements. There is lots of products that are kind of like all in one solutions, like dosing something like that. But I would re half time. I just dose stuff at like a half dose, right? You don't want to overdose it, but you just want to make sure you're not deficient in it. But again, it also depends. Like if you never do water changes, pay more attention. If you do regular water changes, you're probably have, you know, trace amounts of trace elements in your tank. Any other thoughts? Yeah, totally. I agree with that for sure. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, scrolling through the chat. Bill Saltwater Haven. What the best CO2 regulator that won't stick? I've used many. I've never actually had one stick, but I'm using, I've been using the carbon dose for the past year or two. It's a pricey bugger, but it's worked well. And I just like the consistency of it. Abe, what do you use? Yeah, I don't use you, anything fancy for that. You used oh, to yeah. use a calcium reactor. Yeah, yeah, I used yeah. to um, use a carbon doser too. Those are the. I, I haven't tried everything, but those are very good. 
If I was yeah. to get a calcium reactor again, I would get a carbon doser. Pricey yeah. for sure, though. Would you get a calcium reactor again, or would you just stick to your 500 mils a day dosing? No, yeah, I'm close to <laughs> so getting much. a calcium reactor. <laughs> but I'm going to hate that I still have to dose elk on top of that, but... I do that. Hey, I have cal- calcium reactor and elk dosing right now. I strive, yeah, I like strive for simplicity, so... <laughs> Oh, I, I would rather just to give do you one. guys an idea. I dose 600 mils of my alkalinity a day on top of my <laughs> calcium reactor, which is the 50 pound geo reef, the the 18 by whatever. The day one eight. It fits 50 pounds of media in it. Uh, <laughs> oh, I yeah, love it. It's it's ridiculous, and I dose calc at night. And and my alkalinity solution that I mix is like is like highly concentrated too. Like I mm. saturate the crap out of it. So I don't know what it is compared to like ESV or something, but it's probably a lot stronger. Yeah. yeah. I haven't used ESV in ages, but I used to like it when I used it. I like the trace everything. It had a nice simplicity yeah. factor to it. It seems like yeah. um a great product. Like mm. all those those company made two parts are pretty good. It seems like people have good results with them, like ESV and I guess Braywell sells one. It just, mm-hmm. I'm just saying it makes me curious. Should I try that? But I'm going to stick with the cheap stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the end of the day. DIY bulk is, is hard to beat that price wise. And I did it for yeah. many, many oh. years, but now he's a calcium. Yeah, and right, uh, so and I, I, I was saying, I actually use the, I don't know if this is sort of ill-advised because I use the, uh, fauna marine, uh, trace, uh, one, two, three with my, um, two part that I make myself. And mm-hmm. I just use the same weights of the calcium side and the alkalinity side, because they sell you their own calcium chloride and their own. See, the only thing is that, uh, like I'm. I bet the calcium chloride is just calcium chloride. It's probably, that's all it is. But um, I would say the alkalinity component is probably a mixture of, um, of I don't know, sodium bicarbonate, sodium carbonate, and other carbonate sources in a certain specific ratio. So I might be messing around with that. But either way, I think if you're going to do bulk additives, consider adding the trace because you just add like, you know, it's like not very much. It doesn't cost very much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now you know, you're getting some in there. So when you're saying what's in there, I know when I used to use my bulk industrial stuff, it was like 94% calcium chloride, 96. And I always, always, I was always like, what is that extra four to 6%? Like, that who, knows? Yeah, who knows what it is? Weird. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what the bucket said, the bag. So I don't know. I used it for years. Yeah. Didn't have any issues, but again, the caveat, if you do water changes, you're going to dilute whatever the contaminant is. You never do a water change potentially there's a potential issue long-term of some, whatever the nasty is building up like small amounts, probably not an issue, but eventually it's going to build up. So that's mm-hmm. always my, my caveat yeah. with doing like the non reefing stuff is who knows what's in it. That, that being said, reefing stuff very well could be them just rebranding it. I mean, it could totally. be more pure. It's hard to say. Like it I depends. tried a company and yeah. they, it was just the same thing of calcium yeah. chloride. Yeah. It's like, man, this is dreadful yeah. salts. Um, some calcium chloride I've definitely found has more brown, like more of a brown color when you mix it. Um, mm-hmm. So whatever that is, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, the same thing goes with salt mixes too, right? Some of them have mm-hmm. more of that brown, rusty kind of um, precipitation that yeah. happens on the on the mixing container. Um, I um, So one thing that, oh, that I always found interesting because I always mix, I use a magnetic stir to mix all my supplements just because it's, dump it in it wait for dissolves but there's there's been tons where i've had little particles of random stuff stuck to my magnet i was like oh lovely like you Same. know so that's what i mean there's a, who knows what you're throwing in there yeah to a certain extent i never i didn't use a magnetic stir but i use a tunsy and you know yeah. there's a magnet underwater same thing mm-hmm. yeah um do 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 Devin, ask your guests what they think about dosing phytoplankton daily to supplement or reduce nutrients. That That is an interesting one. I have heard people saying that they've had a nutrient reduction from dosing phytoplankton. So yeah. my thoughts on that are you dose F2 media to culture phytoplankton as basically your nitrous phosphates you're feeding to it. So maybe if your light from your tank is causing photosynthesis to, you know, basically make it grow and culture in your tank, then it's probably sucking that up. But at the same time, if you're dosing lots of phytoplankton 
it also is potentially full of stuff. I've heard of people using like miracle Girl fertilizers and stuff if they're not using the, the F2 stuff for it. And then you're potentially adding nutrients that way. So, I mean, it could almost go either way depending on how it plays out in your system. So, mm. I don't think yeah, I'd I'm use it for nutrient that. purposes specifically. But. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know how the direct it's, it's it's not a direct impact though. It's like more of like uh, the phytoplankton, uh, like feeds the fauna, and the fauna are part of the consumption of these things. Or is it actually like a chemical thing that happens? It I, wouldn't. I don't know. It wouldn't. Or is be it chemical. like a carbon? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think it would be more of a food source, right? Because you have to feed those nutrients to the phyto to culture it. So yeah. my my assumption yeah. would be that your aquarium lights are the light source. And it's just sucking some of that out. But I think you'd have to dose a lot mm. to actually have a noticeable yeah. impact. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So that's my thoughts. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I think we kind of said most of the things we want to say about nutrients. And, and you know, um, yep. yeah, I actually probably got to get going here. Yeah, this uh, is pretty soon at this stream point. in ages, I, I two would hours. Keep going if I, didn't, I actually would just keep going if I didn't have a comedy show I was going to in like Ooh, 20 sounds, minutes. So. Oh, that sounds uh, fun. Nice. Yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, we will we'll have to do it again one day. It was definitely fun having both of you guys on at the same time and just throwing different thoughts yeah, at sure. each other. All right, guys. Awesome. Hope, hope thank you both for coming on today. Definitely appreciate it. Um, hopefully, you guys enjoyed this. I do have both of your websites in the description. I will add your YouTube channels afterwards. So if you guys want to check them out, definitely check them both out. They are both awesome guys. And if you need coral, Canada, US, the stream has you covered. We got probably the, the two <laughs> nicest coral groves around on right now. Um, so yeah, definitely appreciate you guys. Check out their websites in the description below. If you enjoyed it, hit that like button. And yeah, we will definitely dig in some more random stuff on a future fun live stream. Adam, Abe, thank you guys. Right. Yeah, thanks appreciate so much, it. Devin. Thanks for having me.